Blackstone Audio presents No One Left to Tell by Jordan Dane. You'd better have a real good reason for being here. You could have been shot. Her voice echoed in the darkness. Silence. Her fingers tightened on the weapon. Had she been mistaken? How did you know I was here? In the dark, the intimacy of the deep voice sent shivers across her skin. Feeling along the bank of electrical switches, she turned the dimmer knob to slowly illuminate the room. Dressed in jeans and a black sweater, Christian Delacourt still wore a brown leather jacket and black gloves, a sign he hadn't been here long. Maybe you're not the only one who can see in the dark, Delacourt. To my grandparents, Kosas Finas and Pog Mathon. In any language, these phrases translate to love in my family. Chapter 1 Warehouse District, South Chicago On the trail of money, Mickey Blair sniffed out opportunity like most men chased skirts. One led to the other, but Cash never got a headache. The piece of paper fluttered in his hand as a brisk wind caught its frayed edge. He scrolled it with spread fingers to read his own scribbling and looked up, squinting against the cold to verify the warehouse number. The place was a pit. He stuffed the crumpled paper into his overcoat. He'd hoped for better arrangements from his potential new client. The email he'd received late yesterday had been cryptic, but he was confident the job would be simple and the money irresistible, the best kind of incentive. A glance at his Rolex assured him he wasn't late. With the sun fading into the layers of dark clouds along the horizon, the bite in the air stung his cheeks. Large wet flakes accumulated on the ground, defying the swirling gusts. With a sideways glance, he caught sight of his black Mercedes parked to the left, his latest toy. He'd soon have it stored for winter. Time to break out his SUV. His work provided a nice little nest egg. Images of white sand beaches filtered through the cold. The imagined scent of coconut teased his senses. He pictured grains of sand clinging to his dark skin slick from tropical oils. Before long, he'd be set for life. Killing was a lucrative business. Safely locked away until he needed it for a job, his custom-made Heckler & Koch sniper rifle had been a good investment. At his age, he had cultivated a dependable, discreet reputation over the years, Mickey enjoyed the best of both worlds, flying below the radar of law enforcement while reaping all the benefits of his deserved notoriety. The art of assassination provided him a life worth living. He loved irony, when it suited him. A smile influenced his swagger as he approached the side entrance to the building. His unfastened overcoat buffeted in the breeze. Instinctively, he felt for his gun, a Sig Sauer secured in its leather holster under his suit jacket. After a tug at the metal door, he rubbed his palms together to wipe away the rust and dirt, careful not to soil his coat or Armani suit. Once inside, he shortened his breaths to lessen the intake of stale air and surveyed the carcass of the old deserted warehouse. But his next breath morphed into an instinctive gasp when the door slammed shut behind him. He turned and heard a key slip into the lock. The deadbolt slid into place, and he caught the distinct sound of someone running away. He yanked at the door, the filth of the cement floor crunching underfoot. Locked. What the hell? He muttered under his breath, then called out, This isn't funny, you sick bastard. Slowly he gaped over his shoulder into the cavernous space. In the split second his eyes oriented to the murky and cluttered interior, the lights went out. Complete darkness. His equilibrium distorted. He couldn't see his damned hand in front of his face. He raised his weapon, fingers tensed against the grip. If this is some kind of joke, someone's gonna get shot. He raised his voice, covering his tension with attitude. I don't have time for this. Make time. A low voice assumed familiarity. 
an echo disguised its origin. I made time for you. The sound mutated to a whisper, prickling his skin. Do I know you? Mickey swallowed hard. His eyes searched the dark for anything at all. No answer. The man wasn't giving him a chance to locate his hiding spot, offering a target for his Sig Sauer. A glimmer drew his attention. Heading toward the flicker of light, he felt his way along a barrier of varying height, stubbing the tips of his shoes. In no time he lost his way. He couldn't tell where he had entered the old building. Thud! Thwack! Two rounds hit his chest. A burst of liquid burned his nostrils. Vapor stung his eyes. Silenced gunfire? His hands reached for the sore spots under his suit, rubbing the welts. Anger got the better of him. He returned fire. Pointing his gun into the dark, he shot twice before thinking. Muzzle flash blinded him. Fingers pressed against his eyelids, he squeezed his eyes shut and listened to the ricochet. Who are you? he shrieked. Spittle ran down his chin. Feeling like a cat with nine lives, he bristled with hostility. If the pellets had been real bullets, he would have been dead. What kind of game are you playing here? The air was stagnating and thick. Sweat trickled from his brow, nearly blinding him with its sting. He leaned against something firm. All he needed was time to think. God, think! Who the hell are you people? he shouted. More than one person hid in the dark. Strange animal noises erupted overhead. The muffled sound of laughter mocked his torment, his only reply. Although he couldn't be certain, it appeared they were hurting him through a maze of obstacles. They pounded him with pellets of some kind. The animal calls only got worse, clamoring all around him. Primal instinct kicked in, and panic gripped him hard, squeezing his chest. Remembering to close his eyes, Mickey fired two shots, reminding them he would be dangerous up close. "'There's been a mistake. I was asked to come here. Some guy had a job for me,' he cried, trying to reason with his faceless attackers. What the hell had he done? The irony wasn't missed on him. Now the tables were turned. Normally the predator— this time he would be the hunted. Blood boiled under the surface of his skin. He shrugged out of his overcoat and kicked it aside. Tugging at his tie, he pulled it over his head and hurled it into the dark, not caring where it landed. Only a week ago, he'd bought the designer tie, more impressed by its price tag. Now he didn't give a rat's ass about any of it. His fingers slick with sweat, he yanked at the collar of his shirt. Buttons popped off onto the warehouse floor. He squinted in every direction. Nothing but blackness. Emptiness magnified the sound of his heart. Another blast from above. Something slapped him hard. It burned the skin of his neck. He winced and shrugged a shoulder. An object stuck to his body, then slid under his collar and down the inside of his shirt. His fingers followed the path, but he gave up trying to find it. What the hell? Jesus, what's wrong with you people? With these bastards tracking him in the dark, it meant only one thing. He had to find a hole to hide, unsure where that might be. Feeling his way on all fours, Mickey crawled to change positions. His fingers felt along a wall, but he didn't know if he'd be heading for the door or deeper into the maze. One way might be his salvation, the other would be certain death. Thwack! A round hit above him. On instinct, he covered his head with an arm. A damned sitting duck! No time for doubt. He had to move. Slowly, he stood and picked a direction to run, a hand out in front. He had trusted his luck for a lifetime. Surely it wouldn't fail him now. Thud! An explosion against the side of his temple sent swirls of blinding light through his head. His eyes on fire, they burned like acid. Chills of shock ran through him. When he slumped to the floor, his gun skittered across the cement, lost in the darkness. Stunned, he needed only a moment to catch his breath. Only a moment. 
He pushed against the wall behind him, struggling clumsily to his feet. But a death-like stillness seized him. A presence eased closer. Slowly, he turned his head, tears rolling down his cheeks. Someone was... An arm gripped his chest, cradling him in the grasp of someone standing behind him. He smelled alcohol on the man's breath. You're mine now. The intimate whisper brushed by his ear. It shocked him. The familiarity sounded like it came from the lips of a lover. Don't fight me. For an instant, Mickey relaxed long enough to hope. Maybe all this had been a mistake. Then he felt a sudden jerk. Pain. Searing pain. Icy steel plunged into his throat, severing cartilage in its wake. A metallic taste filled his mouth. Its warmth sucked into his lungs, drowning him. Powerless to free himself, Mickey resisted the blackness with the only redemption possible. He imagined high tide with him adrift. He struggled for air, bobbing just beneath the ocean surface. The sun and blue sky warped with a swirling eddy. Mercifully, sounds of surf rolling to shore clouded the fear when his body began to convulse. Dizziness and a numbing chill finally seized him, and the pounding of his heart drained his ability to move at all. Then a muffled gurgle dominated his senses, until there was nothing. Euphoria swept through him with Blair's last breath. The man's body now hung limp in his arms. With a gloved hand, he reached for the night vision goggles and tossed them to the floor. He filled his lungs with the coppery aroma of fresh blood. Closing his eyes, he released the body to fall hard to the cement. He'd used the ego of his prey as a weapon against him. His plan had worked. As he thought of Mickey Blair lying dead at his feet, only one thing came to mind. Death humbles you when nothing else can. The sound of laughter dotted the dark landscape. His men rose from their positions, one by one. It had been a successful hunt. The contractor on this job would be pleased. With the overhead light crackling to life, shadows ebbed from the grisly tableau. Job well done, men. He raised his voice, relishing the attention. He stood amidst his men. Their applause and shouts fueled his adrenaline. But it ain't over. Let's get this place cleaned up. We got a delivery to make, and we're on a tight schedule. St. Sebastian's Chapel, downtown Chicago Father Antonio's footsteps echoed along the dimly lit corridor between the rectory and the chapel, accompanied by the soft rustle of his cassock. The nip of an early freeze bored through mortar and stone, intensifying the musty, dank smell of the old church. The change in season always challenged his patience. Holy Father, why do you torment me so? Have I not been a good servant? The young cleric smiled. His feelings toward the first cold front had been cultivated from childhood. It had nothing to do with his vocation or his faith. Arched windows lined the hall, offering a secluded view of the church cemetery. His heart sank at the sight of a dusting of snow that outlined headstones and crypts. Images of death, covered by an early winter, encouraged his reflective nature, and sparse lighting along the perimeter of the graveyard only marginally repelled the decaying gloom. He identified with the daunting struggle of light against dark, a symbolic reflection of his life's work. Without slowing his pace, he let his eyes drift from one window to the next, as he walked through the dim passageway. But tonight, a lone man caught his attention. Father Antonio stopped. His breath fogged the small glass pane. There you are, my friend. What demons have drawn you out on such a cold night? Bundled in a long, dark coat, a man hunched against the cold under a pale light, his back turned toward the priest. His body cast a faint shadow in the mantle of snow. A gust of wind swirled white crystals at the man's feet, clinging to the hem of his overcoat. 
Despite having only a scant glimpse of him, Father Antonio knew his identity by the family tombstone. Years ago, he'd investigated the gravesite to learn his name. With the man so reticent to talk, the cleric had succumbed to his mortal weakness of curiosity. He'd invaded the stranger's privacy by searching cemetery records and old newspaper stories at the library, a result of another long winter season with too much time on his hands. Come inside where it's warm, my friend, or do you relish the weather's punishment? He understood the need for penitence. It was the man's ritual to stand by the grave before he'd wander into the smaller chapel to sit in the last pew on the left. Always the man would be wrapped in his own contrition, but tonight his observance changed. He turned to look directly at Father Antonio from across the burial ground. The man peered up through the murkiness of dusk, his eyes locked on to the priest. Father Antonio gasped. He stepped back from the window, his reaction purely instinctive. With his heart battering his chest, he closed his eyes and filled his lungs. After a moment, he exhaled with deliberation to calm his panic. Not very charitable, Antonio, he muttered, shaking his head. Why would he react so strongly? But he knew the answer to that question the instant he examined his recoil. The eyes of the man were haunting. Beyond the sadness the cleric expected to find, death shadowed the stranger. That fact tempered any further interest the priest had in him. Chastising himself for his weakness, Father Antonio forced his gaze into the graveyard once again. He wanted to redeem himself as a compassionate man. But the stranger had gone. In that brief instant he ducked for cover, the man had vanished, leaving only faint impressions in the snow that he'd been there at all. "'Holy Father, give me strength,' he pleaded, whispering for his own benefit. Glancing at his watch, he noticed it was after seven. Already late by his usual schedule. Now he'd have to rush through prayer after this little delay." Resuming his duties, he headed for the entrance to the auxiliary chapel. With the larger cathedral closed for restoration work, the smaller facility remained open to the public at this hour. Unlocking the breezeway door into the church, he was surprised to find the chamber dark. Light from the street filtered through the ornate stained-glass windows. Eerie hues of blue and red spilled across the floor, eclipsed by shadows of tree limbs tossed in the brisk winds off Lake Michigan. The stone walls of St. Sebastian's muffled the howl of the winter blast. He expected the stranger to be seated in his usual spot at the back of the church, not sure how he'd handle the awkwardness of seeing him. A sense of relief came when he found the place dark and empty. Allowing his eyes to get accustomed to the dark, he remained at the door. He listened to the sounds of a room he knew well. With the stillness, he presumed he was alone. But who had turned out the lights? Feeling his way in the dark, he found the control panel for the interior lighting. Let there be light, he commanded. Slowly, he turned the knobs for the fixtures along the walls. It would be all the light he'd need. With barely a glance through the church, he set about his routine. Late-night confessions in this urban setting brought a variety of sinners to God's door. Over the years, Father Antonio had grown familiar with many of their faces, people who'd be invisible to others in the light of day. Kneeling at the base of the crucifix, he closed his eyes to pray for his flock. It had become his nightly ritual before he'd slip into his confessional at the first sight of a sinner seeking absolution. The hush of the church graced his prayer, making it easy to lapse into the familiar. But a faint, repetitive noise beckoned his awareness, detracting from his purpose. A rhythmic patter summoned his consciousness. A measured, tedious sound. Being a resident of St. Sebastian's, he'd grown accustomed to rain finding its way through the worn roof of the rectory but the chapel and its sacristy were another story. Opening his eyes, he caught sight of motion to his left. He spied the offending puddle. A dark, slick pool collected at the base of the crucifix. 
It bled through the spacing between the patterned tiles. Now a metallic odor invaded his senses, mingling with the sweet aroma of incense. Nearly choking on his next breath, Father Antonio felt the chill of the empty chamber crawl along his flesh. Inch by agonizing inch, his eyes trailed up the wall. The beautiful porcelain face of Jesus Christ, forever frozen in his sacrifice upon the crucifix, had been replaced. Lifeless eyes stared down at him. Grotesquely twisted in death, a man's head dangled at an odd slant, contorted by a gaping wound across the throat. The body reflected the pale light of the church in its thin furrows of blood. A muffled scream gained momentum, reverberating through the chapel. For a long while, Father Antonio hadn't realized the cry was his own. Detective Raven Mackenzie spotted her partner, Tony Rodriguez, on the sidewalk outside St. Sebastian's on Erie Street. His silhouette was backlit by rotating beacons of red and blue from the police cars parked behind him. Captured by the street lamps overhead, plumes of exhaust fumes drifted in vaporous clouds. The flashing color should have been a deterrent to spectators, warning of police activity in the area. But every nutcase in the vicinity came to watch the show despite the weather, like there wasn't enough murder and mayhem conveniently available by clicking the TV remote at home. And the purveyors of bad news gathered like vultures. Huddled en masse, the media stood along the street, voices raised with questions vying for attention. She studied the rank and file of expectant faces, well aware how cynical she'd become in the last two years since her assignment to homicide as a new detective. Hell, you live closest. What took you so long, Mackenzie? Rodriguez grinned, his words fogging the air. Being on call, she had her evening interrupted by the chirp of her cell phone, the jaded voice of her partner on the other end of the line. She'd just popped in her latest DVD acquisition and was chowing down on a mega bowl of cereal, nothing that couldn't be interrupted. Quit your whining, Rodriguez. Your wife would probably love to get a whole five minutes out of you. Irregular gusts whipped between the buildings, gaining momentum. She walked beside him down the sidewalk next to the main cathedral, heading for the smaller church. The darkened stained glass encased in stone brought back memories of an untainted childhood. But she hadn't seen the inside of a church in a very long while. Somewhere along the way, real life had severed the link. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't get any complaints in that department, thank you very much. Raising an eyebrow, he badgered her. At least I got a life, such as it is. What are you talking about? I've got a life. I was spending some quality time with Walt. Just started the platinum edition of The Lion King before I was so rudely interrupted. Normally her penchant for classic animated Disney had been a secret she kept all to herself. A ritual lovingly instigated between a father and daughter. But Tony had found her Cinderella DVD on her coffee table once, before she'd tidied up and shelved it in her small media room, another eccentricity. Without the excuse of having kids, or even a husband for that matter, she'd been busted and had to fess up. So she'd been forced to contend with his incessant ribbing ever since. Sorry, what can I say? It's all about the circle of life, Raven. He shook his head and shrugged gently bringing her back to the reality of their situation in Disney lingo. Hakuna Matata, my friend. She grimaced against the chill. No worries. The idle chit-chat allowed her to prolong her sense of normality, in denial that she'd soon look into the glazed eyes of another victim, sharing the intimacy of death. But casual conversation at the scene hadn't always been a part of her demeanor, in her first few investigations, she had remained stone quiet when she crossed the yellow tape, the pit of her stomach wrenching with anxiety. Now she and Tony talked about nothing, their humor masking something neither of them wanted to discuss. But she'd never learned how to rid herself of the twist in her gut. It came with the territory. 
Out of habit, she felt for the CPD badge clipped to her jeans belt loop under her sweatshirt. She moved it to an outside pocket of her leather jacket. It would give her clearance through the yellow tape and beyond the line of uniformed police officers protecting the integrity of the crime scene. What do we have, Tony? She pulled a small notebook and pen from her jacket, making a note of the date and time. Tugging at the bill of her ball cap, she continued toward the front steps of the chapel. D.B. in a church. What a world, huh? I don't know. Maybe dying in a church is like getting sick in a hospital. Could be worse, I guess. A young officer held his hand up, but let them pass when she tapped her detective's badge and muttered in reflex, Homicide. Then she indulged in the twisted banter only another cop would appreciate. Dead is dead, Tony, no matter how you slice it. Don't say slice, Mac. Trust me on that one. Donning her game face, she walked through the main door, snapping on her latex gloves. Down the main aisle and to the left of the altar, lights were ablaze. Crime scene investigators were already hard at work taking photos, dusting for prints, and bagging and tagging evidence. Staring at the wall to her left, she caught the macabre sight, barely aware she held her breath. Flash! The split-second flare of a camera cast a sickly pallor onto the face of the dead man. Flash! Flash! A man in a rumpled suit hung from a crucifix. His body covered the porcelain likeness of Jesus Christ, strapped in front of it with rope. As she looked at his suit, an odd thought found fertile ground in her mind. Dressing for work this morning, did the man deliberate on his choice of suit or contemplate his shirt color? All of it. So pointless. Raven's world had grown colorless, accented by varying shades of mortuary black. This same theme had infringed on her peace of mind more than once lately. You all right? Tony reached for her elbow, his dark eyes centered on her, blocking out everyone else in the room. Yeah, she waved him off. Just thinking about something else, it doesn't matter. There is nothing else, Mackenzie. For people in our line of work, it all begins when we cross the line. Remember that. He smiled faintly, falling into the role of her training officer once again. After she nodded, he turned and blended in with the others. It all begins when we cross the line, she repeated one of Tony's favorite sayings to reinforce the thought, getting her head back in the game. But crossing the line for Tony meant the crime scene barrier set in yellow tape. For Raven, it took on a more symbolic meaning. Crossing a line meant risk, and in taking that risk, change would be inevitable. Was she prepared for a change in her life? When she gazed around the room, a familiar thought gripped her. There's got to be something else, Tony. At least I hope so. She whispered as if in prayer, and St. Sebastian's was a good place for that. Raven drew closer to her partner. She heard him give a directive to one of the beat cops. Canvas the neighborhood. See if we can catch a break. Find someone who caught some suspicious activity outside the chapel. You know this neighborhood best. Grab yourself a team. The senior CSI, Scott Farrell, jutted his chin in greeting. Hey, Raven. Hey, Scott. You just about ready to bring him down? She asked as Tony joined them. Her gaze traveled up the wall following the rope that suspended the cross and the body. Looks like a job for more than one person. What do you think, Tony? Yeah, looks that way. Our priest over there says they haul the cross down for cleaning. That's the only reason it's not permanently attached to the wall. Without the DB, one person can break a sweat just with the crucifix. But with the added weight? Yeah, it's at least a two-person job, Tony replied, watching as two CSI techs strained to lower the body. So we're looking for more than one suspect with no respect for the church. Two to hoist, but only one to do the carving. Raven scribbled a note, then focused on the sign pinned to the dead man's shirt. 
The words were printed in ink. Safety pins fastened the scrolled message. Seek the truth, Christian. No respect for the church, but what do you make of the sign? She countered. Religious fanatic? Could be. Her partner sighed. Zealots are the worst to figure. Maybe digging into the Vic's background will tell us something. Looking over her shoulder to the priest sitting in a pew three rows back, she asked, "We got a witness." Even from this distance, she saw the man shaking, his eyes avoiding the gruesome sight of the body being lowered. "No, no such luck. That'd be way too easy," Tony replied, a look of compassion on his face. "That's Father Antonio. He found our DB and called in the nine one one. No sign of forced entry." The chapel is usually open at this hour. Lowering his voice, he added, "The good father is pretty shook up. Once we get the body bagged and off the premises, we'll talk to him. See if he remembers anything new." She studied the priest. Short, dark hair framed a full face with childlike eyes. Yet after what he'd seen tonight, she felt certain he'd be irreparably marred by his experience. When she started to turn away, he caught her eye for an instant. Raven understood the pain conveyed in that look. She wanted to smile, but couldn't bring herself to do it. A slow nod was all she managed, but it had an impact. The priest returned her gesture, then closed his eyes briefly before sinking into the pew. "Easy now, lay 'em down easy," Tony directed. With the cross and body lying flat on the floor, a CSI team member snapped countless photos. Raven felt like an interloper into the dead man's final moments. The horrified expression on his face was frozen in time, immortalized as evidence by the camera. Raven scrutinized the body and noticed something peculiar. Where's his coat? On a night like this, he should have had a coat. Tilting her head, she tried to get a better look. And his tie is missing. Expensive suit like that would have a tie. Good eye, Mackenzie. Tony nodded. And the slice and dice with a knife might make it personal. Once the cameraman left, Raven stepped closer to the body and directed her question to Farrell. Shouldn't there be more blood? I mean, a wound like that. Kneeling, she stared dispassionately into the mutilated face of the victim. Her training helped to obscure the horror, but she knew this would be one more image to keep her up nights. There's no arterial spray either. We'll know more after the autopsy, but yeah, it looks like this isn't the kill site. There'd be more splatter in the church if the cut were made here. And check this out: fresh drain over dried. Scott knelt by her, holding a pencil in his gloved hand. He pointed to the dried stains on the man's suit. The minimal pooling we see at the base of the cross was probably only made when the body was first hoisted up. What little blood was left at that point? That'd be my guess for now. With the temp in the room, won't have anything definitive on time of death until the M.E. does the post mortem. But my best guess at this point is two to three hours. Her partner narrowed his eyes and stared at the face of the dead man, pointing a gloved finger at his temple. "What's this? Looks like some kind of bruise." The CSI man leaned closer, about the size of a nickel. Pulling back the shirt collar of the victim, he pointed out, "Looks like there's another contusion here, on his neck." Not prepared to give you an answer on that one. We'll know more from the M.E. And what's that smell? Tony asked, sniffing the air near the Vic's face and clothes. Something medicinal or chemical? Raven closed her eyes and inhaled, sensing the first thing out of order. Alcohol. I smell rubbing alcohol. With another whiff, she added, "It's all over his suit." I'll run an analysis on that, skin and clothes. The CSI man offered. He gave direction to one of his techs. No sign of defensive wounds, but let's get those hands bagged. 
We may get some trace under his nails. Robbery's not the motive. Check out his Rolex. Feeling for the man's wallet, Tony found it tucked in his breast pocket. And he still got his money and credit cards, but no gun in his holster. Guy might have used it, though. Directing his next comment to the CSI man, he asked, What about gunshot residue? We'd better check for GSR on his hands, see if he fired it recently. With the dead man's jacket open, her partner found an ID badge with photo clipped to his belt. Our Vic is Mickey Blair. Concern registered on his face when he looked at Raven. And it looks like things just got more complicated. Tony held the badge for her to see, and Raven sighed. Well, how'd we get so lucky? We'd better let the chief know. Let me know what? The booming voice of Chief Sanford Markham echoed down the aisle. With the press out front, the man never failed to take full advantage of a good photo op. The tall, elegant black man walked toward them, dressed in a tux with a long wool coat and scarf, buffeting in his wake. Raven always suspected the man had been born on Krypton, a distant relation to Superman with his X-ray vision and supernatural hearing. And now it would appear Chief Markham had a life outside the office, something she couldn't claim. In reflex, she stood at attention when he neared. Tony had been slower to react, but quicker on his reply. The man worked for Dunhill Corporation as security. Nothing like a high-profile murder investigation. This man might only be a foot soldier. Maybe it doesn't have to be high-profile. Chief Markham contended, his eyes taking in every detail of the scene. In fact, I insist on it. This type of case can get ugly fast. I want low profile with every I dotted and every T crossed. Everything by the book, yes, sir, Tony replied with a glance toward Raven. Like always. Not just by the book, detective. I know Fiona Dunhill. She can be a tough woman if she chooses to be, and politically well-connected. What are you suggesting, sir? Tony's body stiffened. I'm not suggesting anything except to get the job done quickly and with a little finesse, Detective Rodriguez. Make sure you cooperate with Mrs. Dunhill to the extent possible, without compromising the case. Do I make myself clear? Yes, sir. Crystal. Tony waited for the man to turn and head toward the exit before he muttered, Clear as mud. I heard that. Without missing a step, Chief Markham lifted his hand and shook a finger in admonishment. He kept walking, but bellowed over his shoulder. And can you two dress a little more professionally when you talk to Fiona Dunhill? Quit taking fashion tips from Vice and Narcotics. Raven's jaw dropped. She glared at the back of the chief's head as he left the chapel. Very uncharacteristic for a murder scene, a low rumble of laughter echoed through the room. It ended when she tried to catch the offenders. Even Father Antonio had been distracted enough to break his solemn expression with a faltering smile. Tony only shrugged, checking out her attire. Personally, I've always liked your taste in sweatshirts. With a grin, he tugged at the brim of her cap. And your cop's cap is way cool. A sure sign of a bleeding heart, always rooting for the underdog. Her father's cub's ball cap and her family home, a small bungalow on the fringes of the northern suburbs near Lincolnwood, northwest of Wrigley Field, had been part of her inheritance. Sergeant John Mackenzie had died in the line of duty fifteen years ago when she was nearly seventeen. With her mother dead just after her birth, she'd been practically raised by the central station house without a female influence in her life. Coming from a long line of police officers, Raven had little choice but to pursue law enforcement as a career. It was a connection to her father, a bond they shared that transcended his death. You're not exactly Mr. GQ, Tony. Look at you. She fought to hide a smile. 
His menudo concert T-shirt was his prized possession. She didn't have the heart to make fun of it. I guess between the two of us, we're walking billboards. Don't be slamming my tea. I love menudo. He mumbled under his breath, hand over his heart in mock sincerity. I know, Tony. She indulged the man with a pat on his shoulder. Ricky Martin was in Menudo. Did you know that, Raven? He whispered, adding a conspiratorial wink. Yes, Tony, and I'm living la vida loca. She nodded, humoring him. She made some final notes in her book, but couldn't resist a quick glance down at her attire. She had to admit she'd been influenced by Tony's usual fashion choices. The man worked under cover and came from the ranks of narcotics. And being called at all hours, Raven paid little attention to her work clothes. She usually pulled her dark hair into a quick ponytail and poked it through the back of a ball cap. If she needed to deliberate over a case, she'd usually turn the cap around, rally style. Her good luck ritual. It helped her think more clearly. Over the years, she'd sacrificed fashion for function, working in a male-dominated career. Wearing makeup and donning anything remotely feminine always drew unwanted attention. These days, her fashion accessories included her badge, handcuffs, cell phone, a nine-millimeter Glock tucked into her shoulder holster, and a thirty-eight strapped to her ankle. Being a gear freak, like most cops, she ordered more equipment and clothing from Gall's law enforcement website than she did from any hoity-toity fashion catalog. Come on, back to work. Tony's voice summoned her. You done here, Raven? After a quick nod from her, he gave the order. Go ahead, bag him. When the gurney rolled down the center aisle with her partner following, Raven wandered toward Father Antonio and sat beside him. Someone had given him a cup of coffee. The styrofoam cup shook in his hands every time he sipped. The caffeine will probably keep me up tonight, among other things. He raised the cup, but stopped and lowered it again, avoiding her eyes. Sorry, I don't know what I'm saying any more. It's okay, Father. I understand. I'm Detective Raven Mackenzie, and that's my partner, Detective Tony Rodriguez. She shook the hand he offered. Tony waved from a distance, then joined them. He sat in the pew in front. Tell me what happened, Father Antonio. She began. Not much to tell. I came here to take confession. Got to the chapel just after dusk, maybe a quarter after seven. I was running a little behind my schedule, so I wasn't paying much attention. I'm afraid. That's when I found. His voice trailed off. He took another sip of coffee. The dark, steaming liquid quaked in his grip. With the cup now held in his lap, Raven stared down into the dark ripples of his coffee when he spoke. I was praying when I heard the tripping sound. I thought we had a roof leak in the chapel. He tried to find humor in his assumption, but his laughter sounded more like a choked sob. With the priest's last remark, Raven found the eyes of her partner to see if he'd caught the same thing, but his face was unreadable. She persisted, "Did you see or hear anything out of the ordinary, Father?" It was dark, the priest replied. His eyes stared straight ahead, as if he were reliving the moment. The chapel lights are usually on, but they weren't when I came in. And did you know the deceased father? Did he come to church here? She asked. No, but I didn't. I couldn't look at him. The priest shook his head, struggling to block the memory. Can you think of anything else? She prompted. The young cleric shook his head, staring into his coffee cup. Well, if something comes to you, anything at all, call me. Even the smallest detail might help. Raven handed him her business card. Touching his arm, she got him to look her in the eye. Be sure to get some help in dealing with this, Father. Don't try and do it on your own. Call me if you need a referral. Thank you, Detective. I appreciate your concern. I'll call if I think of anything. Father Antonio stood and shook their hands. 
Two other priests escorted the young man back to the rectory. She and Tony watched him walk away. You thinking what I'm thinking? She glanced toward her partner. Depends on if you're thinking Starbucks and a Krispy Kreme would taste pretty good right now, and that you'd like to get home before midnight. But if you're thinking that, I'd say we've been partners too long. He bantered. When she narrowed her eyes, giving her best sarcastic look, he asked for clarification. Enlighten me. I was just thinking about that whole blood dripping thing and how he heard that. I think our good father had someone watching over him tonight. When Tony looked puzzled, she explained, "The Vic's blood was still dripping. That means Father Antonio barely missed the killers making their renovation to Saint Sebastian. I think that whatever made him late probably saved his life." Raising his eyebrows in agreement, he pursed his lips and nodded. Interesting observation, Mackenzie. Well, you know what they say. He works in mysterious ways. Maybe Father Antonio's guardian angel will bring us good luck. She punched Tony's arm affectionately. Now let's go tackle some paperwork. With us talking to Fiona Dunhill tomorrow, I got a feeling a mountain of paper, stale coffee, and second-hand smoke from the bullpen is going to seem like heaven. Even though false bravado tempered her voice, she knew enough to worry. Money and power were a deadly combination in the wrong hands, and Fiona Dunhill had both. Chapter Two, Dunhill Estate, Shoreview Historic District. Get a load of this place! Tony gawked at the acres of pristine countryside. They must have a riding mower. People like this don't get their kicks from wrangling the trusty Toro. They hire it done. Raven teased. Her eyes on the rearview mirror, she made note of all the firepower carried by the armed guards at the imposing fortress at the front gate. Security personnel dressed in black uniforms commanded the precision of the military. Maybe more like well-paid mercenaries, but mission accomplished. The entrance to the Dunhill estate was a battlement. Yet once inside the grounds, she found the view spectacular, despite the cold gray morning. Age-old oaks were rooted to the fertile soil, the expanse of their branches giving an air of timelessness. Slowly negotiating the curves of the asphalt drive in her police issue burgundy crown vic, Raven marvelled at the grand estate looming on the horizon, a white colonnade of southern charm with the backdrop of Lake Michigan. This place is like a throwback to the late 1800s, and so close to the heart of Chicago. Amazing! She widened her eyes in awe. They pulled up to the front tiled steps. Raven suddenly felt intimidated by the size and opulence of the manor. Tony must have felt it too. He squirmed in his seat, crooking a finger between his neck and shirt collar. I thought this clip-on tie wouldn't feel so tight around my neck, but my damn shirt collar is choking me. Raven fought to hide her amusement. Apparently, there were no secrets between her and Tony. If he admitted owning a clip-on tie, much less had the nerve to actually wear it. I know you're not comfortable, but you still look nice, partner. She grinned. When he stopped his fidgeting and returned a smile, his dark eyes softened. She knew his pale blue Oxford button-down didn't fit any more, and admittedly, his brown herringbone sport jacket, with its dated elbow patches, should have remained hidden in the back of his closet. But Tony was her partner, for better or worse. Today just happened to tip the scales on the side of worse. You clean up good, but I miss your old man's cubs hat. He winked. Most of last night, she'd debated what she'd wear to the Dunhill mansion. Her navy pants suit hid all her usual accessories of gun, badge, and handcuffs, so function won out. For fashion's sake, she left the ankle-strapped thirty-eight in her locker at work. This hour of the morning, a massive shootout seemed unlikely at the posh estate, and with the welcoming committee out front, she'd be severely outgunned. 
Before we get in there, let's talk game plan, Raven. What did you find out about Fiona Dunhill? She shifted her weight in the front seat and turned to her partner. From what I've researched, Dunhill Corporation doesn't fund all this grandeur. That's just a smokescreen. The real money came from the illegal arms trading of Charles Dunhill, the late husband of Fiona. Yeah, kind of remember him from the old days. To tell you the truth, I was kind of surprised a socialite like Fiona Dunhill would have taken over the business after her old man's murder. Crime families run by women are so rare. I guess it's not unheard of, Tony reflected. He turned his gaze toward the front door, and she's evidently doing a damn fine job of it. But she's still involved with that dirty little business, Tony, or maybe she's just turned a blind eye to it. Furrowing her brow, she corrected herself. Actually, from what I've read, she took that side of the business and went underground, laundering the dirty money with the legitimate end of her investments. Raven's life had been about order and the law, so a woman like Fiona Dunhill didn't add up in her book. But she knew her partner would temper her strong tendency toward black and white. Tony was far more pragmatic, better able to tolerate the gray in their world. I'll give her this: the woman's a total contradiction, and she's pretty shrewd, not being caught and all. Hard to track that kind of money trail. He shook his head. So, what else do we want out of this visit? Raven prompted. You are the chief, quick and by the book. Kind of pie in the sky to think we can bring her down on all her illegal activities, no matter how tempting that might be. But we've got a murder to solve. Reaching for the door handle, Tony looked concerned. I just hope she doesn't erect any major roadblocks. Raven stepped from the car and slammed the door. She felt the thrill of the chase as she caught Tony's eye, but butterflies the size of vultures were cavorting in the pit of her stomach. Come on, partner. Game face on. We're crossing the line. In the hallway of the second floor, Fiona gazed at her reflection in the ornate gold-framed mirror. The same dark green eyes stared back, but the intensity of youth was long gone. Or maybe her tired expression had more to do with the news she'd heard from the guards at the front gate. Two police detectives were now in the parlor, waiting for her. We are not punished for our sins, but by them," she muttered. Short auburn hair streaked with gray framed her face. Mindlessly, she tugged at its strands. Her once flawless complexion looked pale in this light, without the blush of youth. She'd grown accustomed to the deepening lines on her face, but this morning they were more pronounced and showed every one of her fifty-four years. While her socialite friends were being jabbed with syringes of Botox or scheduling discreet face lifts, she had been determined to live with every crease. She would accept her penance with grace. Time to face the music. With her hand sliding along the banister, Fiona took her time coming down the steps. Her pale blue silk ensemble clung to her body. The fitted material made her feel manacled. She kept her eyes on the open door to the parlor near the front entry. A young woman sat on the divan by the hearth. Her shoulder-length jet black hair reflected an aura of crimson, with the fire crackling behind her. Even in profile, the young detective was most attractive. A dark-skinned man in khaki pants and brown sport coat paced in front of her, adjusting his tie and collar with a finger. At the base of the staircase, she raised her chin and drew back her shoulders, donning the persona of her public life. To what do I owe this pleasure, detectives? Fiona breezed into the room. Good morning, Mrs. Dunhill. I'm Detective Tony Rodriguez, and this is Detective Raven Mackenzie. Both held their badges for her inspection. We are investigating. Before we get started, may I offer you coffee or tea? She interrupted with a casual smile. 
Without waiting for a reply, she turned toward her attendant standing inside the door. Benjamin, please bring in a coffee service and some pastry for our guests. I'll have my usual Earl Grey tea. Thank you. When the manservant left the room, Fiona seated herself in a brocade wingback chair and adjusted her dress hem over her knees. Detective Rodriguez relaxed enough to sit next to his partner on the Davenport. The warm glow of the fire flickered on their expectant faces. Sorry to interrupt. Please continue. The male detective spoke. I'm afraid I've got some disturbing news. We're investigating a murder, and the victim was one of your security people, Mickey Blair. His body was found last night at St. Sebastian's, a local church in downtown Chicago. She fought to keep the look of shock from her face, but she was certain she failed. She would have to do better. Mickey Blair, you say? Insecurity? Her voice cracked. She cleared her throat to disguise her mistake. I'm not sure I recall the name, but I have a large number of people under my employ at Dunhill Corporation. As she suspected, her past had come calling, not a welcome visitor. We'll need access to Mr. Blair's duties and his personnel records, anything to give us a clear picture of him. Who can help with that type of information? he asked, flipping open a notepad. Detective Rodriguez commandeered the conversation, but the young female detective captured her interest. Raven Mackenzie sat, her eyes fixed on Fiona's every move. Even returning her stare, she couldn't shake the young woman's dark eyes. They hadn't faltered for an instant. Unnerving. But intimidation would turn the tables. Dunhill records are confidential, and as for his duties, that is certainly off limits. For the first time, the young female detective spoke. Why would you fight us on a murder investigation of one of your employees, especially if you aren't familiar with the man or his duties, as you say? Detective Mackenzie was too clever for her own good. Rigid in her chair, Fiona clenched her jaw and took a breath before speaking. A potential solution came to mind. Perhaps I didn't make myself clear. Certainly I would like to get to the bottom of this, but unless I can be assured you're working with one of my own people in this investigation, without limitation, then my full cooperation shall never be granted. Turning two detectives loose to pry into her dealings with Mickey Blair was unthinkable. Without question, she trusted only one person to look out for her interests, yet she couldn't picture him working with the police under any circumstances. She'd have to do some pretty fast talking to convince him to do her bidding, and he'd have to set aside his animosity for law enforcement, but she knew he would be her only hope. A court order would be required, making your efforts an uphill battle, and the head of my security would conduct his own private investigation, completely autonomous to your endeavor. She kept her face stoic, a payoff from living a life in charge. And I may not be in the mood to share. An awkward void in conversation filled the room. Only the steady crackle of the blaze persisted. Fiona pressed, now that I've conveyed my meaning adequately, I assure you it is far better to work in concert with me than against my wishes. So do we have ourselves a bargain? Do we have a choice? Detective Mackenzie's resentment was unmistakable. None, actually. I'm glad you've seen the light. I'm sure your delightful Chief Markham will be most happy. He and I have known one another for years. She reminded them of the political pressure she wielded. Breaking the stalemate, Benjamin entered the room with a silver tray, setting down the coffee and tea service on the table in front of the detectives. Is there anything else, madam? Everything looks lovely, Benjamin, thank you. Detectives, please, join me. In a peace offering, Fiona extended her hand, then reached for her cup of tea. Detective Rodriguez poured some coffee, with his partner eventually following his lead. So who is our new comrade-in-arms? 
Detective Mackenzie asked, stirring a spot of cream into her coffee. And he'd better like long hours and lousy coffee. We can't use an eight to fiver. Christian Delacourt is head of Dunhill Security, and I can assure you he is strictly twenty four seven. I wouldn't have it any other way. He's more like family. And as for his cultivated taste in coffee, I'm sure you'll find he doesn't compromise. Great, nothing like breaking in a rookie. So where can we find Juan Valdez, connoisseur of Java? The young woman's wit amused her partner. The man nearly choked on his coffee, but Fiona suspected her security head would find difficulty tolerating it, especially given the fact Raven Mackenzie carried a badge. I am certain at this hour, Christian is working off some steam with his men. He won't be pleased with his new assignment, so I'll have to finesse his cooperation. Maybe even order him to work with you if it comes to it. Seeing a spark of hope in Detective Mackenzie's eye, Fiona interceded. Before you ask the obvious, Detective, let me clarify: if Christian chooses not to take this assignment, I won't force him. But you won't get my cooperation either. But you're his boss. Ordering is what bosses do. Only they call it delegating or a paradigm shift in responsibility, whatever the new corporate buzzword. Raven asserted. Let's just say that Christian is his own man, and I trust him implicitly. He always has my best interest at heart. He's been a part of this family since he was a boy of ten, but you should be aware he has a past where law enforcement is concerned. I'm afraid. A criminal record. The young woman's eyes flared. No, detective, nothing so mundane, and I won't be talking out of school. Not about that. He is a deeply private man. Images of Christian emerged in Fiona's mind, flashes of him as a child and the man he'd grown to be. You'll discover his nature soon enough. I've had the pleasure of getting to know him better over the past twenty-five years. And he's still a fascinating puzzle. You said he was blowing off steam. Where is he? The spa, the tennis court, maybe. Taking a sip of her tea, Fiona hid her enjoyment of Detective Mackenzie's assumption. She ignored the implication that Christian was a kept man. I shall escort you to the war room so you can see how he amuses himself with a few of his men. Christian constructed it for his use and named it appropriately. I have to warn you, he's not expecting you. I'll have to convince him to do my bidding, but I can be most persuasive. Yes, ma'am, we can attest to that. Persevere, detectives, and he'll cooperate when he's ready. Fiona stood, allowing them to set down their coffee cups. Follow me. This way, detectives," Mrs. Dunhill directed them with a wave of a hand. Her genteel voice echoed down the long corridor. Oversized tapestries and ornately framed oil paintings adorned paneled walls on the second floor. Raven hadn't seen anything like it. The extravagance took her breath away, but the theme displayed in each piece disturbed her. Ancient battles and death were forever frozen in time. The art of warfare commemorated in exquisite colors and gilded frames, as in a museum. Charming. Who did the art selection, Attila the Hun? Raven muttered to her partner, but her hostess must have heard. Christian selected each piece. Once you see the war room, you will understand completely. He has a sense of humor, albeit black as coal. Mrs. Dunhill had been reserved until now. But when the woman raised a corner of her lip into a quick show of cordiality, Raven got the distinct impression Christian Delacourt had earned her respect. After you, their escort smiled and held a small door open to usher them inside. Built into the wall at the end of the hallway, the door's dimensions were dwarfed in comparison to the grandeur of the rest of the manor. Why do I feel like Alice looking down a rabbit hole? 
Raven whispered as she stepped across the isolated portal. And Fiona Dunhill is beginning to look an awful lot like the Cheshire Cat, Tony mused. Minus the furry striped tail, I hope. Once inside the strange room, Raven's eyes adjusted to the murkiness of dimmed, recessed lighting. Steps descended along four rows of stadium-style seats. A focal point of the room was the wide window down front, and a cavernous antechamber lay below, just beyond the glass. A door on the left connected to stairs leading to the floor of the gymnasium-like chamber. Raven saw the interior of the larger room strewn with barricades, hulls of old cars, and walls of sandbags, looking like a war-ravaged village. "'This is our observation room. Please take a seat in the front row, detectives. It looks like we haven't missed much.' Mrs. Dunhill's voice was mixed with pride and fascination. Faint voices sounded on the overhead speakers within the confined space. Drawing her attention to the floor below, a group of uniformed men circled a shirtless man, clad only in his black uniform pants and military-style boots. The group seemed oblivious to their presence. One of the five men blindfolded the man in the center. With a hood placed over his head, he looked like he would face a firing squad— minus the last smoke. His tanned, muscular torso glistened with sweat, but the others looked well-rested. Their uniforms were impeccably creased. What had this poor man been put through before she'd entered the room? He must have drawn the short straw and would pay for his bad luck. Transmitted over the speakers above, a guard's voice penetrated the quiet space of the observation deck. "'If you're ready, lights out!' After a nod from the hooded man, the overhead light extinguished. Blackness filled the large chamber. Raven couldn't see a thing below. Her hands tightened on the armrest. Edging forward, she peered through the dark. "'I'm turning out the lights here as well, but the glass is equipped for night vision. You'll be able to see everything, just like the guards. Only they'll be wearing night vision goggles,' Mrs. Dunhill explained." The window is a mirror into the chamber. They can't see us, but we can see them. The small space went pitch black for only a second until the viewing window activated. Raven's eyes adjusted to the crimson glow cast into the room. Speaking of Disney, our new partner must be goofy, Tony whispered for her alone. The man's gotta be twisted. What sort of guy orders his men to go through this kind of abuse and calls it training? He shook his head. That poor hooded bastard is like a lamb being led to slaughter. In awe, Raven's jaw dropped. Realizing what was about to happen, she spoke aloud. What the hell is going on down there? Is he insane? Most probably. Fiona spoke in a hushed tone. The pale red glow cast an eerie shadow on her face. But watch. This is remarkable. Equipped with night vision headgear, the small army of five waged war against the hooded man. To Raven's utter astonishment, the guy going solo was the aggressor. Before any of the guards moved, one had been incapacitated by a spin kick to the gut. A quick jab followed, directed at the man's head, but the blow had been pulled up short to avoid injury. The guard doubled over. Gasping for air, he'd been taken out of play. The count was four to one. The fox eluded the hounds for now. In their dark uniforms, the four remaining men nearly blended into the blackness, and the hooded man with dark pants looked headless, a fierce torso suspended in the gloom. Radiating the crimson of night vision, his body reflected a strange aura. Being one to root for the underdog, Raven found herself pulling for the guy who should have been at a disadvantage. Edging closer to the window, she felt Tony doing the same. The hounds circled the fox, coming in for the kill. Raven tensed, holding her breath. One man raised an odd-looking rifle to his shoulder and fired a round at the prey, narrowly missing his chest. 
a streak of color dribbled down the wall where he'd been standing. Anticipating the shot, the fox had rolled to his right and ducked for cover behind sandbags. But just as quickly, he prowled again, going after the man who fired the shot. The very weapon used on the offense gave away the guard's position, a deadly game of Marco Polo. Raven reminded herself that the guy was blindfolded. How extraordinary! Is this paintball? she asked, keeping her eyes fixed below. In the dark? Christian adapted a variation of the game, adding the hood and blindfold. Fiona's voice was monotone, barely a whisper. The war game captivated the woman. A loud groan erupted over the speaker. The fox took out another hound. And where is Christian? Watching from somewhere while this poor schlub gets nailed? Tony scoffed. That poor schlub is Christian, Detective Rodriguez. Didn't I make that clear? Raven heard the smile in the woman's voice. He'd never expect this from his men. All he wants is for them to do their damnedest to take him out of the game. Silence. Her partner caught her eye with a puzzled look. Anyone ever do that? Tony's voice filled with admiration. He scooted forward to check out the action below. No, not to my knowledge. Mrs. Dunhill was proud of her head of security, a man who'd just used one of his guards as a shield for a paintball blast. With his forearm around the guard's throat and a hand grappling the man's head, he could have easily broken his neck. But this was a training game and not about killing. The guard held up his hands in surrender. Delacorte had taken out three of the five hounds. Raven narrowed her eyes into the blackness. This was their new partner? So much for treating him like a rookie on a murder investigation. This man wouldn't be fetching coffee or allowing them to fill his days with busy work. Yet the prospect of working with him intrigued her. A marvel to watch in the dark, he felt his way without benefit of eyesight. The man reacted like a bat, using sonar to navigate. His controlled and powerful movements were efficient, a predator on the prowl. Narrowly escaping one paintball round after another, Delacorte reacted on pure instinct. "'I got a feeling about our new partner,' she whispered to Tony. "'I think we just invited the fox to our hen house, and his name is Colonel Sanders.' "'I hear ya,' Tony nodded. "'Old-fashioned or extra crispy. Either way, we're fried.' Mrs. Dunhill's voice broke the eerie calm of the room. "'I hate to interrupt his sport, but I'm sure you have work to do, a murder to solve.' The floor below grew quiet. On the hunt again, the fox searched for his next victim. Fiona Dunhill stepped forward, speaking into the intercom. Her voice echoed into the cavern. "'Christian, we have guests, and I need to speak to you, please.' Slowly, the men stood and removed their headgear, but only after Christian capitulated by raising his hands. Lights gradually brightened, and the guards dispersed. The war games were over. After a furtive glance, she turned off the intercom to give Christian and her some privacy. If you'll excuse me, I'll only be a moment. The older woman left the room and descended the stairs, looking unsettled for the first time today. Something we said? Tony chided. Yet Raven felt uneasy, strangely disappointed the match was at an end. Drawing closer to the viewing window, she nibbled at the inside of her lip, waiting. When Mrs. Dunhill approached the man left standing, he tugged at his black hood. Raven found herself eager to put a face to the name of Christian Delacorte. Barely winded, Christian pulled off the black hood, then yanked the underlying blindfold to hang around his neck. His dark hair tousled, he ran fingers through the waves to straighten it. With a questioning look, he asked, What's up, Fiona? What's so important? Concern softened his usually solemn expression. 
Sorry to have interrupted you, Christian, but something has happened. I need your help. She watched his reaction. Anything, just ask. Tossing the hood aside, he reached for a black T-shirt lying across a sandbag barricade. Ready to pull it over his head, he stopped when she reached for his arm. Don't be so quick to volunteer. She felt the warmth of his skin slick with sweat. I'll understand if you can't do as I ask, but I don't trust anyone else. That sounds ominous, he replied. His rich voice echoed in the war room. Guess you better fill me in. Come on, I'll follow you upstairs. No, we can't go up just yet. I need to talk to you here now. Without pushing, he waited for her to speak. Christian's penetrating stare caught her by surprise. His gaze acted like a truth detector. Even in childhood, his eyes best captured his guarded nature. It hadn't always been so, but tragedy changed a person. She knew that from experience. Two homicide detectives are in the observation room. Mickey Blair got himself killed last night. Saying it aloud made her stomach twist. His particular skills earned him business apart from his security work at Dunhill, and I'm afraid this work may have contributed to his death. Christian narrowed his eyes, the sternness back in his expression. What are you leaving out? At first, Fiona didn't know what to make of Mickey Blair's death. The man had seen the dark side of her nature and had kept her secret, true enough. But with him dead, there was no one left to tell. She might have felt a weight lifted off her shoulders, except for one thing. Someone else had pointed an accusing finger by stepping in the middle and killing Blair in the process, and that scared the hell out of her. Christian waited for her answer. Revealing everything to him might cost her his devotion, so she tempered her candor with a gnarled fraction of the truth. In a past life, I did some things I'm not proud of. And Mickey was part of that life. Her throat clenched. A tear slid down her cheek. She turned her head, avoiding his stare. Did you have anything to do with? He stopped. As he stepped closer, she heard his whisper. Just tell me what to do. I'll protect you. His hand gently squeezed her shoulder. His willingness to safeguard her interests without fully understanding the truth touched her deeply. It reassured her she'd chosen the right man to trust with her life. Turning, she looked him in the eye, speaking in a hushed tone. No, I didn't have him killed, at least not in the way you might imagine. You're being so damned cryptic. How can I help if I don't understand? I need you to work with the police on their investigation. They've already agreed to— She never got the chance to finish before he shot back. What? Why the hell would I— Anger brought color to his cheeks. He pulled away from her, throwing his shirt to the floor. You know how I feel about the damned police. And I wouldn't ask you to do this if it weren't my last option, Christian. She hated seeing his pain revisited. Every muscle in his body tensed with her cry for help. I don't trust anyone else. Please. Damn it, Fiona. He crossed his arms over his bare chest, his face tight with a grimace. After a long moment, he dropped his head and eased the tension in his muscles. Damn it, he whispered. What do you need me to do? Raven spotted another security camera following her every move in the observation room. The whole estate was overrun with red blinking eyes of the high-tech variety. Nudging her head in the direction of the surveillance equipment, she informed her partner. Looks like Big Brother is watching. They probably got cameras in the john. What do you think? God, I hope not. I gotta use the facilities before we leave. If they got cameras in there, then my big secret will be out. Every woman in the greater Chicago area will be looking for some loving from Don Juan Rodriguez. 
He smirked, raising an eyebrow. Probably more like Speedy Gonzales. And it's amazing your ego fits in this room. She rolled her eyes, then turned to watch the drama unfolding in the war room. From this distance, she couldn't tell much about his looks, not having a clear view of his face. But it would appear Java Boy didn't like his new assignment, gauging by his anger. This was just fine by her. She didn't need a new partner. Would love to be a fly on the wall down there. With your luck, you'd get swatted once the lights went out. The guy's deadly in the dark. Story of my life, partner. She shrugged. Before Tony asked what she meant by that, her cell phone rang, saved by the bell. She answered the call. Mackenzie. Detective Mackenzie. A soft voice called her name amidst the static of a bad connection. Father Antonio, is that you? Knitting her brow, she pressed a finger to her other ear. I can barely hear you. Yes, it's me. You said to call if I remembered anything. The priest raised his voice. Raven paced the floor, trying to get better reception, but nothing helped. Yeah, I did. Do you have something to add? Leaning against the viewing window, she plugged her ear tighter. From the corner of her eye, she caught movement down below. Mrs. Dunhill and Christian Delacourt were headed upstairs, with Mr. Security slipping a T-shirt over his head. With her so close to the glass, she was pleased she couldn't be seen from their side of the two-way mirror, but soon her privacy would be gone. There was a man in the cemetery last night. You saw someone. Hunching her shoulders, she tried to find a spot that gave her the least amount of static. Had she heard the priest right? Tony stepped closer, nearer the viewing window. Yes, well, sort of. But he didn't come to the chapel that night. He broke the pattern. What are you saying, Father? I'm sorry. I'm not making any sense. Let me start over. I saw a man in the cemetery last night, just before I went to the chapel. Probably why I was late. Did you recognize the man, Father Antonio? She heard hope in her voice, but the sound of footsteps on the stairs outside the room made her heart beat faster. What did you see? I didn't really see his face clearly, but I know who he is from researching his family's gravesite. I've got newspaper clippings, articles from when they died. I know who he is. A shadow fell over her shoulder, eclipsing the light from the war room chamber. Slowly she turned, coming face to face with. Christian Delacourt stood on the stair landing outside the observation deck. His eyes lined directly with hers, as if he knew exactly where she stood on the other side of the two-way mirror. With only thin glass between them, his stare stole her breath like a thief. Most women would find him strikingly handsome, with his dark green eyes, strong jawline, and full lips, raw sensuality. His physical size surprised her. Up close, his broad chest, muscular arms, and narrow hips dominated her. With his skin still flush from exertion, it seemed to radiate the same heat to her face, warming her cheeks. On a cold night in Chicago, the man could replace her space heater hands down. Yet a glacial hardness to his eyes shot chills down her spine. An electrifying sensation that closely resembled desire in her book, the word intimidating came to mind, dangerous. Yet it was more than that. His masculinity commanded her senses in every way. No doubt, this man could push all her buttons, even ones not in the instruction manual. But he wasn't a man to trifle with. Nearly dropping the phone, she cleared her throat and finished her call. That's good, Father. We'll be right over. Fumbling with her phone to disconnect the call, she couldn't take her eyes from Delacourt. His glare never wavered. She whispered, "Can he see me, Tony? How the hell can he see me? 'Cause he ain't human. That's why. I think I seen this on Buffy the Vampire Slayer." 
Fiona Dunhill touched Christian on the arm in an apparent effort to stop him from playing his intimidation game. But before Cruella de Vil and Count Dracula joined her and Tony, Raven let her partner know what was going on. "'We've got to make a stop before we head back to the station house, Tony. Our priest may be a witness after all.' Fiona stepped into the observation room before him. His eyes adjusted to the dim lighting. Christian squinted, searching the room for— "'Detective Raven Mackenzie!' A woman with dark hair stepped forward, extending her hand. Her dark eyes never flinched, even when he returned a glare. She spoke again. And this is my partner, Detective Tony Rodriguez. With only a brief glance down to her hand, he ignored the gesture and walked by her, totally neglecting the other man. He winced at the pain of a burgeoning headache. Today would be bad. He pressed a finger to his temple, hiding his discomfort. Sorry, I need to wash up. He knew that sounded lame, but he didn't give a damn. His sweat gave him a pathetic excuse not to be more civil. Normally he wouldn't care what they thought, but Fiona might. It was the best he could do with the war still raging in his head. His war games took a toll every time he indulged in them but they were a compulsion he couldn't ignore. They had been his salvation and his curse. Yeah, well, the woman pointed a finger at him. Nice meeting you, too. Fiona broke the tension in the room. Christian agreed to work with you. As we discussed, he's to be part of your investigative team, with all privileges. That's the only way you'll get my full cooperation. Do we have an understanding? Or shall I call Chief Markham and have him settle this? Christian turned back and eyed the female detective. He let his gaze take liberties. The rude behavior had been intended to intimidate the cop, but once he got started, the maneuver backfired. He liked what he saw. Liked it a lot. Her shapely legs and the hint of an athletic build under her suit only conjured up distracting images of the bare skin underneath and her jacket did little to disguise her full breasts. When she caught him staring, the woman crossed her arms and returned the gesture. He cocked an eyebrow. Interesting. And gutsy. Her piercing eyes nailed him, strafing his body with greedy interest, and apparently she had no intention of backing down. She refused to be intimidated. Yet another seductive quality. Her partner's voice interrupted their restrained skirmish. No, no need for that, Mrs. Dunhill. I think we understand one another. Detective Rodriguez stepped forward, placing himself in front of Raven to break the growing tension. Directing his next question, the detective sent a clear message for him to back off. I'd say our next step is to set up a game plan. If you're free later this afternoon, say around three... I'd like to have you come to Central Station on South State Street to catch up on what we have so far. Does that work for you, Chris? With his deliberate and pointed use of the familiar nickname, Detective Rodriguez got the desired results. Slowly shifting his eyes, Christian refocused his attention toward the man. The name's Delacourt, and if you'll give me some time to freshen up, I can come with you now. Abruptly, the female detective interceded. No, that won't be necessary. And like you said earlier, you need to wash up. An excellent idea. Her dark eyes full of attitude, she tilted her head. Take your time. We have an errand to run. Three will be soon enough. He ignored the obvious bum's rush she gave him, curious about the woman. But dark memories had already started to rise to the surface of his consciousness— a white noise that would escalate. He didn't have much time before the onslaught began. Raven. That's an unusual name. If you ask Tony here, he thinks it's because I come from a long line of Raven lunatics. I can see the family resemblance. He hurled the first volley across her bow, but didn't stick around to see the indignation he knew would be in her eyes. See you at three. 
Christian had to get out, unable to wait any longer. Leaving Fiona to deal with them, he stepped through the door into the second-floor hallway. His footsteps echoed in the corridor, then down the staircase. He headed for his quarters, a small cottage near the pool that had been closed for the season. All the while his mind was adrift in the past. With war games fresh in his memory, the images blurred with his childhood terror, as they always did. Not like always, Delacourt. This time is worse. The flashes of memory came, wave after wave. Fiona's request must have instigated the intensity of his reaction, but he couldn't stop it. The violent images intruded on everything. Even in broad daylight, their assault clouded the familiar sight of his cottage. Unending darkness escalated into suffocating fear. Torturous screams stabbed his memory, only drowned out by incessant gunfire and a painful ringing in his ears, and the feeling of being completely defenseless unleashed debilitating despair. God, please, not now! Catching sight of the cottage, he quickened his steps and distracted himself with a recollection. As a boy, he'd been terrified of the dark after that night, when his life had been changed forever. But now he found an odd sense of relief with the anonymity of it. It took him years to cultivate the feeling, but in doing so he'd paid a price, isolating himself in his obsession. Get a grip, Delacourt! Closing his front door behind him, he shut his eyes and slowed his breathing. Clammy skin scurried chills across his chest. His demons were never far from the surface. God, Fiona, this time you've asked too much. Gray slush glistened on the road, plastering Raven's wheel wells with melted snow, dirt, and salt. The sun fought a losing battle, eventually covered by the onslaught of dingy clouds. When she drove by the chapel, Raven caught sight of the yellow police tape whipping in the breeze. In the stark daylight, it served as a cruel reminder of what had taken place only last night. Children played on the sidewalk, yards from the barrier. The murder investigation, coupled with the renovations to the cathedral, left this neighborhood without its shining spiritual beacon. Another obligation tugged at her. She had to find the killer and restore balance to this community. Pulling into a parking spot in front of the rectory, she listened half-heartedly to Tony's advice. All I'm saying is, you better not push this guy too hard. He doesn't look like the kind of guy who'd take it well. He's dangerous, Raven. Yeah, I hear you, partner. Killing the engine, she turned to him. It's just that he got under my skin, and when people do that, I push. Don't I know that, he chuckled. After sliding out of the car, he slammed the door. Hey, before we go in there, just wanted you to know I have no intention of sharing everything with our new partner from Transylvania. You and I are going to sanitize that file. He's only going to see what we want him to see. It's still our case. Glad to hear you say that, partner. She grinned and tapped her fist to the top of her gray-splattered per gray crown vic. Now let's see what the priest has to say. On the stoop, Raven pushed the doorbell, hearing the buzzer muffled behind the door. Father Antonio answered the chime. Eyes puffy from lack of sleep, the young priest looked older. Thank you for coming so quickly. Can I get you any hot tea or coffee? It's such a chilly day. I could use some coffee if it's made, Raven replied. Tony followed them, letting her establish rapport with the priest once again practiced maneuver. You didn't get much sleep, huh? A fleeting smile flashed across the cleric's face. No, not much. But it helped to pray. I didn't feel alone. Knitting her brow, Raven wondered if it would be that easy. Could she erase the images of death with prayer? Or would her petition fall on deaf ears? A part of her didn't want to know the answer to that question. I brought the file from my room. It's on the table, he offered. He gestured around the small kitchen and break room. 
please, fix whatever you would like. Raven quickly filled a mug with black coffee, foregoing her usual cream. She couldn't take her eyes from the manila folder on the table. Once at the table, she pulled out a chair and sat near the priest. So, tell me about what you saw last night, father. When I was on my way to the chapel, I saw him at his family's gravesite. He comes here often. You said before that the man didn't follow the pattern. What did you mean by that? She asked. I think he saw me watching him. That's probably why he didn't stay. The man's eyes. I have to admit it. He scares me. Father Antonio met her gaze, then clarified. He usually goes to the cemetery, then comes into the smaller chapel. He never talks to anyone, just sits in the back pew. But last night, he... He what, Father? Tony edged closer. What did he do? He just... vanished. Tony tilted his head, then smiled. People don't just vanish, Father. With all due respect, were you nipping at the sacred chalice? Humor, the great equalizer in Tony's book. Father Antonio chuckled. No, I can assure you I was not imbibing in wine, detective. But the man didn't come into the chapel. He just left, I suppose. Like I said, the chapel was dark when I got there. Someone turned the lights out. All I know is that I saw this man in the cemetery before I found... Raven's gaze dropped to the manila folder placed before her. And you said you know who this man is? You did research on him? Yes. I hate to even admit it now, but I was curious about him. He was always so reticent to speak to me, so I... His voice faded. Pushing the folder toward her, the priest added, Take a look for yourself. Raven opened the folder, finding countless newspaper clippings and other documents in the file. But one name she recognized. Are you sure about this, Father? After Father Antonio nodded, she looked across at her partner. You're not going to believe this, Tony. Chapter 3 Raven pulled at the collar of her coat to fend off the chill. She still held the file Father Antonio had given her. With Tony at her side, she stood within the wrought iron gates of St. Sebastian's Cemetery, her eyes upon the headstone marked Delacorte. Roses wilted by the frieze lay abandoned at the base of the stone jutting from the ground, and the floral offering eclipsed a marker for a child. A tribute of a weathered cloth doll lay against the monument. Christian Delacorte's parents and younger sister had been killed on the same date, according to the headstone. And the newspaper clippings in Father Antonio's file told little of how a ten-year-old boy had escaped the same fate. "'You know how I feel about coincidences, Raven,' Tony's voice drew her back. "'Delacorte was here last night.' Not to play devil's advocate, partner, but the priest didn't exactly get a good look at him. Looking back over her shoulder, she turned toward the breezeway windows to the right. Not from this distance, and in the dark with snow falling? He won't make a credible witness. Maybe we just see what Delacorte says about it. We'll get a shot at him this afternoon at three. We pretend to catch him up on the case, then turn it into a subtle interrogation. You up for the challenge of one-on-one -on -one with Mr. Freeze? I don't want to hog all the fun. Why one-on-one? -on -one? Just seeing the way you got to him at the Dunhills. If anyone can get Delacorte to talk, it'll be you. With caution in his voice, he added, Be careful with this guy. If he's dirty and you push the wrong button, he could be real dangerous. But I'll be in the next room, watching his every move. Raven wasn't sure if Tony didn't have that backward. Christian Delacorte slipped his way under her skin without effort. She would have preferred to pass on round two with him, especially with her shrewd partner watching behind a two-way mirror. Not sure I agree with your take on it, 
But if we're going to do this thing, we better run a background check on Delacourt. I got to have more ammunition on this guy. Agreed, he replied. Her partner turned to head back to the car, then glanced over his shoulder. Let's get out of here. Place gives me the creeps. He wandered away, muttering, which is ironic considering what I do. But Raven found herself rooted at the grave, wondering what drew Delacourt back here, time after time. Images of her father's funeral flashed in her mind. Even though he'd been taken from her by an act of violence, she hadn't witnessed his death. Her memories were grounded by a father's love. Yet in contrast, what monsters lurked in Delacourt's past? Only a young boy, he'd seen everything, according to the newspapers. She couldn't imagine such horror. Some of the articles in the priest's file alluded to a bungled police raid by crooked cops, nothing proven. She now understood Christian's resentment toward law enforcement, even if it did hit close to home. And to compound the outrage, his desire for retribution couldn't be directed at anyone in particular. Charges were never filed. She had no doubt he believed a massive cover-up had robbed him of justice. No wonder he bristled with hostility to the badge. Despite feeling a connection to this man, she had to remain objective in her investigation. If he had killed Mickey Blair for a reason they'd yet to uncover, she must be able to see it and act upon the evidence. Her sense of duty bound her to that pledge. But something gnawed at her gut. Nothing about this case looked simple, and with Christian Delacourt involved, she had the feeling things were going to get complicated. The smell of fast food came from her waste paper basket, providing a necessary alternative to the ever-present odors of cigarette smoke and stale afternoon coffee that permeated the bullpen of desks across the homicide department. Someone had left a nearly empty coffee pot on the burner. The stench lingered heavy in the air, challenging her ability to block it out. Reading over the file on Delacourt, she was lulled by the usual background noise. Ringing phones, the never-ending sounds a metal desk makes, and idle sports diatribes in low male voices. From various searches, she uncovered that Delacourt had graduated with honors from the business school of the University of Chicago with an MBA and a minor in computer sciences. He had also received training from the FBI SWAT school in Denver and had achieved expertise in hand-to-hand -hand combat, handguns, executive protection, and high-speed driving, all the credentials of a security specialist. But his unique training method in the dark seemed highly unusual, almost a personal fixation. Raven made a note in the margin of a page. The thought steeped in her brain as she tapped the eraser of her pencil against the file. Overall, he was squeaky clean. Certainly, nothing implicated him as a killer. The chief wanted a briefing on the investigation by the end of the day, and they didn't have much to report. You know... After we checked out Blair's apartment, I kept thinking we missed something, she muttered, looking up from the manila folder. We found an SUV in his garage, but the man struck me as a guy with more extravagant taste in vehicles, so I checked DMV. His Mercedes was AWOL. I issued an APB on it. Maybe something will turn up. Yeah, good idea. It's shaping up to be a long day. After Delacourt, we talk to the M.E., then update the chief. He'll want to know about the autopsy report before his press conference at six. He knitted his brow. Want a cup of coffee? I'm buying. Very generous of you, Rodriguez, considering this swill is closely related to toxic waste. They wouldn't dare charge for it. Maybe we should analyze the stuff in the forensics lab. She shook her head, declining his offer. Not a good idea, Mac. In this case, I'm a firm believer that ignorance is bliss. Before making the trip to the break room, Tony called home to let his wife Yolanda know he'd be late. The sound of Spanish spoken softly into the phone had grown familiar. She'd even begun to pick up a word or two. After hanging up the phone, he reached for his wallet. 
Five bucks says he's late. You gonna take that bet? Tony taunted her with money. He waved it under her nose and dropped it on her desk as he walked by. Guys got a lot of attitude. When he returned, sipping his coffee, Raven replied, "Yeah, I'm gonna take that bet. I got five that says he won't be late. Let's synchronize our watches six till three. No, nothing doing. We use the bullpen clock, and according to that, he's got three minutes to." Before Tony finished, the desk sergeant stuck his head through an open door. A、hey, Mackenzie and Rodriguez got a man by the name of Delacord asking for you two. What shall I do with him? We'll come get him. She smiled, then stood and pocketed Tony's five-dollar bill. Aha!、Uh-huh. You shouldn't be placing any bets today. That clip-on tie is bad luck. I think you're right. Wish I'd thought of that. He yanked the tie from his shirt collar and tossed it onto his desktop, then unbuttoned his shirt. Not sure I have ever heard when a clip-on tie brought any other kind of luck. With a sly look, Tony asked, "Hey, wanna bet that vampire Lestat has never owned a clip-on? Give me a chance to get my money back." After she graced him with only a raised eyebrow, he whined, "Come on, Raven, where's your sense of fair play?" Christian Delacourt would have stood out in any crowd. But amidst the tangle of street riffraff lining the hallway by the front desk, the man looked terribly out of place. Yet he didn't flaunt his difference. Hands in the pants pockets of an elegant charcoal gray suit with black turtleneck sweater, he stared out a nearby window onto a harbor pier on Lake Michigan, lost in thought. The man looked good enough to eat with a very small spoon, but such a trivial analogy didn't fit Delacourt. He deserved better. Alone in a crowd, he wasn't part of the world she knew, and as Raven stepped toward him, she caught the subtle fragrance of his cologne, another distinction from the smell of sweat and desperation in the waiting area. Guess after your shower, you're willing to accept a proper greeting. Extending her hand to force the issue, she kept her eyes on him. Hi, I'm Detective Raven Mackenzie. He turned and glanced down at her hand. She wasn't sure he'd reciprocate, but slowly he acquiesced, a firm grip. Can we get started? The man was all business. Tony raised his fingers in a wave. Hey, how's it going? We got ourselves a room to talk. It's up on two. Raven will take you there. Can I get you some coffee? I'll brew a fresh pot. Delacourt glared at them both, probably wondering if the coffee was laced with strychnine. Raven knew their brew didn't need poison to be considered downright lethal, but the man eventually accepted the offer. Yeah, make it black. As Tony disappeared among the throng of people, Raven escorted Delacourt to the elevators. After she punched two on the elevator panel, they were hoisted to the second floor. Glancing to her right, she caught his reflection in the dull metal doors. Those eyes. She remembered her visit to Saint Sebastian Cemetery, seeing the name Delacourt chiselled in stone. The man's past reflected in his eyes now. Then again, maybe she read too much into him. When they reached their destination, the doors opened. Out of reflex, Raven touched his elbow to direct him to the interrogation room, an innocent gesture. But the intensity of his stare took her aback. Her reaction had been tangible, like an electrical shock to the heart. Damn it all! Control yourself, Mackenzie. This way, she swallowed hard. We've got number four. Delacourt held out his hand, indicating she take the lead. Still, he hadn't said a word since the first floor. His effortless sensuality unnerved her. Only one way to combat that, you know. If you've lost your voice, maybe we should stop off on three. File a report. Her sarcasm earned her continued silence on his part, but for an instant she thought she saw a spark of humor in his eyes. His expression softened for a second. It caught her by surprise. Aha! Score one for the Raven lunatic. She basked in the glow of her small victory. 
More than likely, wishful thinking tainted her perception. She'd love to melt his icy veneer to see what lay beneath. Then again, maybe his true nature would leave her wishing she'd left well enough alone. The thought of him with his guard down sent shivers across her skin. She couldn't remember the last time she'd felt like this. It scared the hell out of her. He allowed her to enter the room first, but his eyes were immediately drawn to the table strewn with photographic evidence. Raven was eager to see his reaction after they'd staged it for that purpose, and if he didn't recognize the church, she would ask him point-blank about the significance of the location. But his reaction had been anticlimactic. If Delacorte had been shocked by the graphic nature of the scenes, he never let on. His expression remained poised and unreadable as he sat in one of the chairs. The body was found in the small chapel at St. Sebastian's. She hesitated, allowing him time to react. Her eyes held firm, watching for a change in his body language. But the man looked unflappable as he thumbed through the photos. Was Mickey religious? she finally asked. A low chuckle escaped his chest, sounding more like he'd cleared his throat. The only thing Mickey revered was the almighty dollar. Raising his gaze, he added, And himself. Dunhill must pay pretty well. His apartment's nicely furnished, and his clothes cost more than I'll make in a lifetime. She sat in the chair across from him. Her eyes never left his. That sounds like you're insinuating something, detective. A thin smile appeared, then vanished. Tomorrow morning, eight sharp at the Dunhill Tower on Michigan. Ask for me. I trust you can detect your way there. I've got you set up with the Human Resources Department. They've been instructed to give you all that you need on Mickey Blair. As if he'd heard a sound, he raised his head toward the large picture mirror along the far wall. Staring beyond his image reflected in the glass, Christian shifted his focus. Raven knew Tony stood in the next room, watching. Uncanny, the man seemed to sense her partner's presence. "'We'll want to see his office, too.' Her voice rose a notch, echoing in the small room as she tried to distract him. And any other place he might have personal effects. I'd anticipated that. He stood and stepped toward the glass, then turned abruptly to face her, leaning his back on the mirror with his arms folded across his chest. You'll get what you need. Raven believed in a strong offense when everything else failed. Time to be direct. St. Sebastian's, are you acquainted with the church? She stood and stepped toward the man, mimicking his stance, standing a safe distance from him. It's quite charming, a historical area of Chicago. A long moment passed. Silence. His face changed almost imperceptibly. Then a lazy smile curved his lips. She found her eyes drawn to those lips, like a damned moth to a proverbial flame. You're fishing, detective, and without a license. I came here in the spirit of cooperation. You and your partner in there have turned this into an interrogation. Without a glance over his shoulder, he rapped on the mirror twice, a signal for Tony to quit playing games. Am I a suspect? Before she answered, the door opened with her partner holding a cup of coffee. Took a little longer than I figured. Sorry. Raven commended Tony's effort, but by the look on Delacorte's face, he wasn't buying any of it. Ignoring her partner's poor acting, the Dunhill security man offered more. I was at the cemetery that night, but I think you know that, and I'm not in the mood to share anything more on the subject. So if you're going to book me, then let's do it. I'd like time to call my attorney so I can make it out by dinner time. Otherwise, I'm out of here. His jaw clenched, and the look in his eyes dropped the temperature in the room. Christian pushed by her, but stopped when she placed her hand on his chest and raised her voice. Hold it! She tried pushing him back to a comfortable distance, but he wouldn't budge. The man's chest felt as solid as a brick wall, and he wielded his gaze like a weapon. Reluctantly, she withdrew her hand. 
Okay, then. You like cards on the table, let's do it. She persisted as her blood churned. What do you think about the message on the body? I didn't figure Mickey for a religious fanatic, not after seeing his criminal record. So my next leap was to assume the message had been intended for someone. And lo and behold, we meet you, Christian. Now that's what I call too much coincidence. Seek the truth, Christian. What does it mean? I have no idea, he replied. But I think you'll have to agree it's not likely I'd kill the man, then sign my own work, directing the police to my door. He remained calm, staring at her and completely ignoring her partner. Am I free to go? Closing her eyes, she filled her lungs, then let out a breath. Calm down, Mackenzie. He was right, of course. Still, she needed to make another point. We've granted you some privileges with regard to this investigation, in exchange for the complete cooperation of your employer. We could have subpoenaed the information we needed and left you out in the cold, yet we extended Mrs. Dunhill a special courtesy. Cooperation is a two-way street, Delacorte. I get the distinct impression you're holding out on me. Raven knew she was posturing, having no intention of allowing him into the investigation completely, but what he didn't know would be no skin off her nose. His eyes narrowed. She felt him harness his emotion, his hostility given away only by the slight stiffening of his jaw. In a move she hadn't anticipated, he stepped toward her, closing a gap already too awkward. Instinctively, she sucked in a breath and held it, filling her senses with the subtle cologne that tempered his act of intimidation. The police will get all the cooperation deserved, detective. His voice low, he embellished his message. I'll make sure of it. Raven heard his underlying meaning clearly. A line had been drawn in the sand of mutual cooperation. Christian Delacorte had no intention of cooperating. She saw it in those captivating eyes. He'd conduct his own investigation, sharing only meaningless information under the guise of collaboration. He'd race ahead, outpacing her and Tony. And with the resources of Dunhill behind him, it would be an uphill battle to fight him. Before she admitted defeat, her partner relieved the tension in the cramped room. But don't you want your coffee? I brewed it myself. Tony held it out to Christian. The city's finest. That's what I'm afraid of. Green eyes glared at Tony. Some other time. Turning his attention back to her, he added, Eight sharp, tomorrow. Coffee will be on me. After Delacorte left, Tony closed the door, lowering his voice. That's one cool hombre. If he's our guy, it's going to be tough to nail him. But I admire your grit, girl. I don't know, Tony. I don't like him for this. He's not our guy. But my gut tells me he knows something. It's in his eyes. Yeah, maybe. And off the record, you may not like him for the murder, but you like him fine otherwise. He grinned. What the hell are you talking about? He's a suspect in a murder investigation. I'd have to be pretty hard up to... Seeing his insufferable enjoyment, Raven stopped her flimsy justification and thumped him on the shoulder with a finger. Next you'll accuse me of cruising the mug books. Hey, not a bad idea. For my sister-in-law, that'd be a step up. He chuckled. Protest all you want, Mackenzie, but a partner knows such things. You just got this soft feminine thing going on, in between all the chest-butting and bullying you tried on him. Personally, I found it charming. Would have worked on me if I was single and into women with handcuffs. Walking out the door at her heels, he poked fun at himself. A full-time job. Now I'm just an old married guy into women with handcuffs. There's a big difference. Damn it. Her partner was a perceptive son of a gun. An endearing yet lethal quality when directed her way. Yeah, well, enough of that. Come on, we've got a medical examiner waiting. Something had indeed just happened between her and Delacorte, and she hadn't been prepared for it. Next time, she would be. Christian's mind reeled as he rode down the elevator. 
It had taken all his discipline to keep his reaction to a minimum. Who the hell had killed Blair, leaving a clear message to him? Seek the truth about what? Fiona had kept something from him. He felt it as sure as his heart beat in his chest. But he knew the woman. It wouldn't be easy to persuade his surrogate mother to reveal her secret. And the point Detective Mackenzie had made about Blair's expensive taste hit home, too. He wondered about it himself, having special insight into the man's earnings as his boss. Walking out the front door of the police station, he welcomed the chill. The cold kept him on edge and sharp. Heading for the parking garage, he made a decision. He would confront Fiona, throwing himself on her mercy. Giving her the benefit of the doubt, he felt certain she had no idea of the personal message directed at him, pinned to Blair's corpse. Fiona had asked for his help in serving as the Dunhill liaison with the police, to be her eyes and ears in the investigation. He owed Fiona so much more than his loyalty. Perhaps it would make a difference if she knew he was nearly accused of the crime himself. That dark-haired detective with the fierce eyes looked like she'd rather lock him up and throw away the key. One thing was certain. He'd conduct his own investigation, and he wasn't about to share anything with the damned police. The naked body of Mickey Blair lay on a gurney pulled up to a sink, a sheet covering the lower extremity of the torso. No matter how many times Raven had observed an autopsy, she never got used to it. Medicinal odors mixed with the smell of death, a tang that triggered her worst memories. Long ago, she'd forced herself to get over the feeling that each victim's privacy had been invaded. Hell, in Blair's case, being sliced across the throat was the ultimate invasion. Suited in surgical gowns, gloves, and masks with shields attached, Chief Medical Examiner Lucy Chapman and CSI Scott Farrell huddled over the corpse. A lab tech reviewed paperwork on a clipboard and labeled test tubes. With a surgical gown draped loosely over her street clothes, Raven accompanied Tony into the room, slipping on latex gloves. Tony's voice echoed in the chamber. We got a meeting with the chief in a half hour. Just wanted to see what you got so far. I know you've barely started. Actually, we found something interesting. It's not much, but it might give you a lead. Dr. Chapman spoke in monotone, with the composure of a CPA poring over a tedious tax return. Raven admired her professionalism. Without any apparent emotion, the woman stood over Mickey with his gaping throat and shocked expression fixed at the time of his death. But under this light, Raven found it hard to dismiss the man's terror. When we removed his clothing, we found that pallet, the doctor explained. She pointed to a small plastic capsule bagged on a nearby counter. Raven bent to get a closer look at the evidence. The medical examiner continued. You'll need to confirm my suspicions, but one of my techs was familiar with that type of pellet. He says he's seen it used for paintball. Are you familiar with the game? Raven's stomach lurched. She knew what Tony would be thinking. She'd been trained to remain objective during an investigation, yet she found herself blinded to Delacorte's possible involvement. Blame it on her cop gut instinct, or had Christian tainted that, too? Damn it! With her eyes focused on the body, she fought to keep the emotion from her face. Yeah, just saw it played, as a matter of fact. Her tone steady, she stepped back to the table, catching the eye of her partner. But why wasn't the man plastered with paint? Wouldn't it have been on his clothes? Good question, detective. You're right, but not if the pellet had been filled with rubbing alcohol. It seems paintball pellets can be purchased separately, filled by the buyer. The CSI man offered his opinion. With rubbing alcohol, the sting of the pellet would be multiplied as it pummeled the body, it would explain the bruising. Pointing to the man's temple and neck, Scott added, He's got dark abrasions here from direct hits. See the breaks in the skin. His chest has only faint markings of impact, maybe lessened by his clothing. Still, it would have stung like hell to be blasted with something like that. 
One of the pellets dropped into his shirt. We were lucky to find it. So we are looking for a sick bastard with a twisted game of paintball. Tony glanced at Raven with a grimace that spoke volumes. She knew Christian would be back at the top of her partner's suspect list. Anything else? he asked. Yeah, we've had a couple of other cases under a similar M.O. Two homeless guys. Maybe a practice run using people that wouldn't be missed. The M.O. is too unique not to be connected. It's a theory. Scott offered his opinion with a clinical shrug. And as you remember, his tie and coat were missing. Didn't find his tie stuck in a pocket, so those items are still gone. And buttons were torn from his shirt. You might get lucky and find them at the murder scene, if you find it. You still think he was killed elsewhere? Tony confirmed. Given the blood evidence, I'd say yes. He was killed somewhere else. Scott pointed to the Vic's pants. And we found small flecks of some kind on his pant legs and hands. We've sent samples to trace, but it'll take time to process. You'll have to check back with me in a day or two. The lab's backed up. Speaking of his hands, anything on them or under his nails? Raven asked. We scraped under his nails. No apparent DNA evidence. But we did find GSR on his hands. Looks like the guy tried to defend himself. With an empty holster, you'll be looking for a gun, too. We've got a check going for his permit to carry. Once we get that, we'll start the search for his missing weapon, Tony replied. Anything on the wound? Time of death? He glanced at the M.E. From the angle of the cut left to right, you'll be looking for a right-handed person. Not much help there. The slice was clean, no serrated edge to the blade. An incised wound transecting the left and right common carotid artery, as well as both jugular veins, causing a fatal hemorrhage. The M.E. pointed a gloved hand to Blair's throat. And as for time of death, the chill in the church distorted the timeline, but my estimate would put T.O.D. at approximately two hours prior to when the body was discovered and called in to 911. The absence of rigor at the church gave us that. I'll let you know if I change my estimate after the autopsy. I'll let you know what we find, Scott replied. Oh, and as for the trace evidence on his clothes and hands, I'll get the analysis bumped up, put a rush on it. You're giving us special treatment, Tony teased, his dark eyes crimped with humor, putting Raven more at ease. Not for you, you ugly SOB. This one's for Mackenzie. I mean, it's not like I've never heard the word rush before. Tony grinned. Well, thanks for the enlightenment. Call me when you have a report. I'll pick it up. Her partner stepped away from the gurney, tugging at his surgical gown. Raven followed, yanking at her latex gloves. Catching a look from her partner, she asked, What? Spit it out. I think I'm getting an allergy toward coincidences, Raven. And right now, I got hives in every nook and cranny of my body. That's an image I don't need, she replied. You talking about the paintball thing? After he nodded, she heaved a sigh. Yeah, I know. All my training tells me I should like him for this, but my gut says this is all wrong. Are you sure it's your gut? He stopped and turned toward her. Maybe your libido is doing all the talking. When she glared at him and opened her mouth to speak, he interrupted her. Look, Mac, you're a good cop. I trust you with my life, but the coincidences are adding up. We gotta look hard at this guy. Can you do that? Without hesitation, she answered, Yes, I can. I've built my life on the law, Tony. It was a gift from my father, the only thing that grounded me after his death. Central Station is my family, for crying out loud. Fixing her gaze on him, she added, But I gotta trust my instincts on this and speak my mind to my partner. Can you accept that? 
He searched her eyes for a long moment, then his expression softened. Yeah, I can do that. I just had to check. Come on, the chief is waiting, and we gotta make nice for the media. Glad I wore my best clip on tie. You mean you've got more than one? Raven followed Tony, but her mind dwelled on her reaction to Christian as a man. How could she explain something she didn't understand herself? And her partner had been right on another count. She had to keep her mind focused on the objective. If Delacourt was the killer, she wouldn't have the luxury to ponder her feelings. Tony might press for his arrest, and she'd have no choice but to do her job. As Christian entered the Dunhill mansion through the kitchen, he found it spotless, without the normal activity. Fiona dined at this hour, and usually invited him to join her, but they hadn't made such arrangements today with his late drive into town. The lights were dimmed. Peering around the stainless pots and pans hanging over the large butcher block table, he spied the gas stove glistening in the pale light, cold as the room in which he stood. A white envelope lay atop the butcher block table, his name penned with Fiona's elegant script. Without opening the note, he knew what would be inside. The emptiness of the manor closed in on him, telling him all he needed to know. He picked up the stationery and walked toward the nightlight, placing the page on the counter. As he suspected, Fiona had left for Paris. A sudden meeting with associates. He knew from experience that whenever she used the word associates, she meant the side of the business she'd always kept hidden, to protect him. When he was younger, he'd hated the fact that she guarded her secrets. Now he understood her intentions and loved her all the more for it. Absent-mindedly, he wandered through the darkened house toward her master suite upstairs. He flipped the light switch. Treading by her elaborately carved four-poster bed into the vast dressing area encircled by mirrors, he noticed her luggage gone. His heart sank. She'd taken all of it. Fiona planned to be gone a long time. Damn it, Fee, he cursed under his breath. His voice sounded foreign, even to his own ear. Reaching into his pocket, he retrieved his cell phone and pressed the direct dial he knew well. Maybe if he told her what he'd found out, she'd come home to help him make sense of it. But as Fiona's phone rang, a faint noise echoed in the master bedroom. His shoulder slumped. The sound came from atop her dresser. Fiona had left her cell phone, severing another link between them. Set near the phone, another note had been placed on her bureau, meant for his eyes alone. My darling... It pains me to leave you this way. I trust you completely, but the police are another matter. My phone would be a beacon for them to locate me. I hope you understand. Be assured, this is not permanent. I need time to clear my head and figure out what to do. Until then, I have key Dunhill personnel assigned to take care of my business affairs, legitimate and otherwise. I will find you when it is safe. Know that I love you with all my heart. But my freedom and my life are at stake. My greatest wish is to see you happily married with children. I will not let my past sins tear apart my hopes for you, dearest. All my love, F. What are you hiding? he whispered. She was protecting him from her own past. His heart wouldn't allow him to believe anything else. She probably didn't know the police were directing their investigation his way. For now, he'd keep that tidbit from her. She had enough on her mind if she was desperate enough to flee the country without him. Christian ripped the note in half, slipping it into his pocket to be burned downstairs. Fiona's note wouldn't become evidence against her. Hitting another speed dial, he rang the hangar for the Dunhill jet. On the third ring, a man answered. Dunhill hangar, Cooper here, the voice burdened with the boredom of night shift. Hey, Coop, this is Christian, just checking to see if Fiona got off okay. Yeah, before my shift. 
The man's voice was touched with concern. Anything wrong? No, everything's okay. Just checking on her flight plan. His effort at nonchalance made the call sound strained. Let me get it for you. Hold on a sec. The silence dragged on, an eternity. If he knew where she was, he might be able to... Well, this is strange. Papers rustled in the background. Christian resisted the urge to ask what the man meant by strange. He already knew. Cooper finally spoke. The only flight plan is to Lanchester, a small private airstrip outside London. Looks like they touched down to refuel, then took off again about an hour ago. No plan listed after that. Do you want me to make contact with the jet? No, I'm sure everything is fine. Thanks for your help. Christian switched off the phone before the man replied. If Fiona had gone to so much trouble to disappear, he'd honor her wishes. But he ached with the emptiness of her departure. She was his anchor, his only semblance of family. Christian looked up, his eyes fixed upon the mirror. A stranger stared back. He'd grown used to the stark look of grief. Robbed of his innocence all those years ago, he'd never shaken the sense of loss. The tragedy cleaved to him like a malignancy, never letting him forget. Yet the greatest cruelty was the things he'd never remember. He still kept his old baseball glove, but came up empty when he tried to recall his father giving it to him. An old photograph of a birthday party felt like the remembrance of a stranger. Joy lay buried in his brain, a casualty of violence. The intrusion of death into his young life had left him maimed beyond hope, leaving him to wonder why he'd been the one spared. Then Fiona had rescued him from the institutionalized care of the state. She made sure he received the best treatment for post-traumatic stress, even taking him into her home. Never judging him, she was the only one who understood his rage and his fear. But now he had never felt so alone. It reminded him of the first time he'd stared into a mirror, looking through a child's eyes, yet no longer a child. Fiona had aligned herself beside him back then. Too numb to understand her reason for caring, he had resisted her tenacity at first, fighting her every move. Eventually he drew from her strength and accepted her nurturing. But his demons had come for him at last, peering out of the shadows of his past. Now they brazenly hovered like vultures, eager to strip him of what remained. The image made him weary. He'd grown so tired of hurting. Shake it off, Delacourt, he chastised. Put an end to it. Fiona needed him for a change. He owed her far more than he could repay. She'd gotten him to this point. The rest was up to him. His desire for revenge had become a weapon, an obsession to overcome his fear of the dark. It gave him purpose, a reason to crawl out of bed each and every day. His weakness flourished into strength, and darkness had become his ally, a link forged despite the countless nightmares he'd endured over the years. Prepared to fight, he tensed his jaw. A stern resolve fired his eyes. He wouldn't let Fiona down. The old clabbered house on Elm Street looked more like condemned property than the residence of Logan McBride and his men. Logan had always despised the accommodations. They were beneath him. The locale allowed him anonymity, decreeing the respect he earned. But fear had been the real driver. Anyone in the surrounding neighborhoods who knew of his reputation gave him a wide berth. On the outskirts of the warehouse district, in a section of Chicago even the police feared to tread, the dilapidated two-story structure was the property of Vinnie Buck, his number two man. Vinnie had earned his status after allowing Logan to leech off his good fortune, such as it was and McBride's mercenaries soon followed, slowly rebuilding his followers after his stint in prison. His quarters were extravagant compared to the others. Wall-to-wall -wall cots dotted the interior of the house while he enjoyed the privacy of his well-appointed single room. It was good to be king. 
Lying on his unmade bed with only a sheet over his bare body, Logan read the newspaper, his shoulders propped up against the old wooden headboard. A naked whore lay sprawled beside him, her dark hair splayed over his bed linens. For the entire afternoon, she'd taken his abusive and forceful behavior, whimpering in a tantalizing fashion when he got too rough. At one point, the pathetic wailing reminded him of a rabbit he'd set on fire when he was eight. This, of course, only spurred him on. Now, after reading about the dead body found at St. Sebastian's, a part of his anatomy grew rigid again as he relived the moment he'd robbed Mickey Blair of his future. Yanking the covers off the woman, he clutched her bare ass with his hand, squeezing it hard enough to earn him a yelp. Don't hurt me! I'm awake! What are you— Before she finished, he'd grabbed a fistful of hair, forcing her head between his legs. I don't pay you to talk. Get to work, he demanded, closing his eyes and burrowing into the pillows at his back. The newspaper fell to the floor. Through his eyelashes, he watched her and grinned. The bob of her head and the feel of her warm, wet mouth really charged his blood— but her humiliation and willingness to take his abuse had been an even greater turn-on. A soft knock on his bedroom door disturbed his reverie. "'Go away!' he ordered impatiently. The hooker's eyes sought his, looking for approval. Most probably she prayed for his dismissal at the intrusion. With a cruel sneer he gave her neither. Hope left her eyes. She continued with even greater determination to please him. He held back his contempt at her pathetic display to curry favor. "'It's Vinny. I can come back.' The muffled sound of the man's voice filtered through the closed door. His smile broadened as he bellowed, "'Come in, Vin.' Then, under his breath, he added, "'This should be interesting.' Barely opening his eyes, he glanced at the man's reaction as he waved him closer. Wide-eyed, Vinny stared at the woman, in obvious admiration of her enthusiasm. Unable to ignore her, he licked his lips greedily, then eventually stammered, "'You cut that pretty close last night. That little priest nearly got sent to his maker, paying a premature call to Peter at them pearly gates.' Vinny's version of small talk amused him, and he appreciated the man's attempt at being cryptic in front of the whore. No need for that. If she talked about anything within these four walls, she'd be fish food by nightfall. I knew you could handle it. Nothing like the rush. He gasped as he came, groaning his approval. Of almost getting caught. With a heavy sigh, Logan closed his eyes again. He shuddered at the woman's steadfast ministrations, then asked, How did Kruger do? He have a sense of humor? His eyes on the hooker, Vin elaborated on their latest recruit, Danny Kruger. He was cool. Took two of us, like you figured. Would have given anything to see the look on that priest's face. Bet he had to change his drawers. A low chuckle rolled through Logan's chest. His hand brushed back the hair of the woman gazing up at him. An enticing mix of fear and adoration reflected in her eyes. As he glanced up at Vinny, he noticed the man leered at the hooker once again. But his number two man kept up his end of the conversation of the convert, despite the lust filling his eyes. Yeah, Kruger's gonna work out. The bastard got a rush out of the hunt, wants to know when we can do that again. He's got a thing for killing animals. Guy's even more twisted about it than you. Still stroking the woman's hair, Logan smiled. I'll take that as a compliment. The hunt is more of a rush when it's up close and personal. His accomplice hadn't missed the insinuation to his work with the blade. He saw it in his eyes as he continued— it's almost better than sex. Almost. Directing his next comment to the woman lying across his lap, he ordered, Go wash yourself in the bathroom and shut the door. 
I want to hear that water running. She scurried away without question, not bothering to cover her bare body. He knew that by the look on Vin's face, the gesture titillated his depraved nature. You look like you got something else on your mind. What is it? Logan demanded when they were alone and the water was running in the next room. Yeah. Vinny's teeth were stained yellow. And Logan smelled the man's breath from across the room, the stench only outdone by his body odor. He tolerated the man because of his interminable devotion, but there were days when Logan contemplated slitting his throat just for the fun of it. He watched the man's Adam's apple bob in place, fantasizing the feel of his blade across it. Thought you'd like to know, they had a female. Detective investigating at the church last night, Vin reported. Oh, he crossed his arms over his chest after pulling the covers to his waist. Logan hated all cops, but by the look on Vin's face, this cop might have his interest. Is she my type? He grinned. Oh yeah, I stuck around to check her out, hung with the news people. I like the smell of that blonde chick from Channel Four. I may need to get me some of that. The man laughed. Vinny's keen sense of denial always astonished Logan. The imbecile would never score with a woman he hadn't raped or bought. Not until the job is done. No more dead bodies until I say so. Those are my rules. Logan narrowed his eyes. The last thing he wanted to do was piss off Blue Blood, the code name he'd given to his latest contractor. Only Logan would make the rules for his growing legion of followers, but the money on this job got his attention. He'd adapt to his new circumstances for the right price until such time as his benefactor became a nuisance. Then all bets were off. It was his world, and no one would define it for him. Whatever you say. Vinny never questioned him. One of the reasons the bastard still drew breath. Did you get a name for that detective, in case I get the urge to confess? Vinny snorted a laugh. Yeah, the talking heads called her Detective Mackenzie out of Central Station, but I didn't get a first name. Glancing at the clock on his nightstand, Logan reached for his TV remote. Maybe that arrogant police chief will have one of his many press conferences. The news at six is about to come on. He turned on the TV with the volume low, keeping his eyes on the television set as he spoke. Mackenzie. When the other man shrugged, he grinned. I must be the luckiest son of a. God, I just love it when a plan comes together. Maybe his benefactor knew his history enough to throw him a bone. Blue blood always arranged such tantalizing side benefits. One of the reasons he hadn't moved on, looking for his next gig. The man paid him well and provided protection to operate freely. He could express his true nature without some idiot passing judgment. Blue blood needed wet work done, and he loved to kill. A match made in hell. As the six o'clock news anchor announced the top stories, the water in the bathroom stopped, reminding him they weren't alone. When she comes out of there, take her downstairs. Give her to the men with my compliments. Vinny grinned, flashing his stained teeth. Can I do a first? Hunger in his eyes, Vinny looked like a wolf tracking the scent of blood. Do what you think is best, Vin. After all, you're my number two man. You've earned seconds. Vinny laughed like a crazed hyena, as if they shared an inside joke. Logan wanted the man gone. Craving his privacy, he added, "Get her out of here. She's had enough time in there." Vin shoved the door to the bath open. The hooker, wet from her shower, wore only a towel. He didn't explain himself. Just grabbed her by the scruff of the neck and hauled her away, not giving her a chance to change. Where she was going, clothes would be needless.
Her eyes pleaded with Logan from across the room, like staying with him would be a better choice. Knowing Vinny and his men, perhaps she'd be right. As the news started, all his attention centered on the TV screen. We start our broadcast with breaking news. Chief Sanford Markham is holding a press conference at... The reporter's voice droned on. As predicted, Markham couldn't resist his face time, and standing behind him was a dark-haired beauty. The chief introduced detectives Tony Rodriguez and Raven McKenzie. Vinny had been right. McKenzie piqued his interest. And now, seeing her for the first time, Logan would make sure their paths crossed. He would want his shot at both cops assigned to Blair's case. No one was beyond his reach. He threw off the sheet covering his naked body and walked across the room. Plans to orchestrate their first meeting festered in his mind. He hunched in front of the TV screen, touching the glass. His fingertips stroked the detective's face along her ample mouth. Surely Blue Blood would understand his need. The hunt would soon be on. He wanted nothing more than to toy with his prey before the final confrontation. Raven Mackenzie. He spoke her name aloud. By defining his choice, he sealed her destiny. Seeing a new target for the first time always aroused him. You and I have a rendezvous with fate. After the press conference, Raven felt the tension from the long day in her neck and shoulders. The basement of the station house held the relief she needed. She spent more than an hour pushing her body to the limit with the usual workout, finishing by pounding her frustrations into a punching bag. She'd worked the muscles of her abs, arms, and legs until the strain poured from her like sweat. Hair pulled into a ponytail and still damp from the shower, she left work in the spare CPD sweats she kept in her locker. She tucked a thirty-eight into a fanny pack by sheer force of habit. Her navy suit and holstered Glock were unceremoniously stuffed into a gym bag. Dry cleaning would definitely be in order. Tony had rushed home in hopes of spending some time with his kids before bedtime. His wife, Yolanda, had been a stickler for the family scene, but got her way on only few occasions. Such was the life of a homicide detective. As Raven headed home, the details of Mickey Blair's growing file picked at her brain. Without deliberating much, she pulled a U-turn, feeling the need for another pass at the Vicks upscale condominium near Lakeshore Drive. With any luck, she'd find a new lead to work. Driving through the intersection onto Lakeshore, she followed the perimeter of Lake Michigan beside the trail system of the park. The volume on her radio turned low. Classic rock played innocuously in the background. Private residences glowed warmly along the thoroughfare, welcoming beacons against the night. In contrast, the few lights on the other side of the avenue reflected onto the blackness of the churning water along a lighted trail system. On a sunny day, the waterfront property would be spectacular. But at this hour, with the remnants of winter in the air, the undulating black looked ominous. The scene prompted a lingering twinge, her fear of the dark. Her phobia had been exacerbated after the death of her father, but in time she had overcome it. Yeah, right. Lying to herself had to be a misdemeanor. She decided to let herself off with a warning. She'd been an investigator on more than a few floaters hauled from the water's depths. Those cases always brought back gruesome memories. Another hazard of the job. Bodies grotesquely bloated in death were impossible to forget. Her detective's perspective of the world would be tainted with such images, offset by the greater satisfaction of bringing murderers to justice. If the reward didn't far outweigh the horror, she would have quit long ago. Shaking loose the old cases, Raven cleared her mind as she pulled into the visitor parking for the Vista del Lago condominiums. After locking the Crown Vic, she headed up the walkway to the secured front door. 
The pristine grounds of the complex were strewn with fall leaves that swirled in the interior courtyard amidst potted evergreen shrubs. The front step, tiled in textured clay, lay beneath a stucco portico, accented with decorative mosaics, giving the building old-world charm. After hitting the buzzer, she prompted the resident manager to answer the intercom and let her into the lobby. She greeted the young man she'd met only the other day. "'Good evening, Mr. Walker. You remember me?' She showed her badge as he nodded. "'I need into Mr. Blair's suite again.' "'Yeah, no problem. And just call me Brian.' Handing her the key, he added, "'When'll you be done with your investigation? That yellow tape is bad for business,' he said, but quickly realized his callousness on the subject of a dead resident. "'Mickey was a class act. I'm going to miss him.' Yeah, well, not sure I can give you a timeline, but we'll do our best. Hooking her finger into the key ring, she smiled and said, Thanks. Not sure how long I'll be. If it's late, I'll keep the keys until tomorrow. Give them back to you then. Mickey's past had been questionable, given his frequent collisions with the law as a young man. Then all that stopped abruptly after Dunhill Corporation hired him nearly twenty-five years ago. Raven suspected the man was anything but a class act. Still, Brian didn't need to know his recently departed resident had a shady past. Innocent before proven guilty in a court of law, Mickey wouldn't have his reputation sullied now, one of the benefits of making the grand exit from this life before his past came back to bite him in the butt. She stepped off the elevator on the eleventh floor and turned left. The elegant carpet runner covered the teak wood flooring along the corridor, deadening the sound of her footsteps. Mickey had been one lucky stiff, enjoying a corner suite with a spectacular panorama of the lake. Now yellow police tape crisscrossed the entrance to his abode. His luck had run its course. But as she neared the door, her eyes caught a glimmer spilling into the hall at the base of the door so faint she thought she'd only imagined it. Reaching into her fanny pack, she retrieved her Smith and Wesson, glad she had her longtime companion from her training days. She listened at the door and heard a muffled sound. Recalling Blair's floor plan, she knew the entry looked onto a posh living area with two large bedrooms to the left and a study and kitchen to the right. A balcony overlooked the lake, only blocked by a set of French doors and strategically placed custom windows along the far wall. Where the sound originated, she had no idea, but given the layout, she assumed someone might be in the rear of the residence, most probably the master bedroom or the study. The yellow police tape hadn't been disturbed. Whoever had slipped inside had done it with great care. Any other way into the condo would have been risky, but not out of the question. After quietly peeling away the crime scene tape, Raven stood to one side of the door so her shadow wouldn't give her position away. She slid the key slowly into the lock and turned it to the right. At the sound of the deadbolt, the subtle noise from inside the room stopped. Damn it! She winced and waited. Her patience was rewarded when she finally heard a drawer slide open. Turning the knob and testing the door, she knew she'd have only a second to slip inside. The light from the corridor would telegraph her entrance. As far as she could tell, the intruder still moved inside with lights out. Raven made her decision. Gripping the butt of her gun, she closed her eyes for an instant, hoping to get her night vision. She opened the door and crept inside. Thank God for a well-oiled door hinge. Now she stood with her back against the wall. The entry shut behind her. Raven searched the darkness, holding her breath. Her ears strained for any subtle change. Pitch black. Only a dim glow from the windows shed a bluish haze into the gloom, backlighting eerie shadows. She stepped cautiously into the room, careful not to make a noise. 
Raven held her gun as adrenaline coursed through her veins, intensifying her wariness and prickling the hair at the nape of her neck. Her eyes darted across the suite. She conjured dark images that shifted in the murkiness, playing dangerous mind games. And now the room masked its secret, still as a crypt. Its hollowness aroused her worst fear. The prowler knew he wasn't alone. Chapter 4 Gripping her gun in one hand, Raven splayed the fingers of her other along the wall and groped for the light switch. Eyes straining through the darkness, she hunted for any sign of movement. Her heart punished her ribcage, apprehension surging in her throat. She finally found the lights to the left of the front door, then paused. Once she flipped the switch, her eyes would take time to adjust, but she'd see more clearly. Unfortunately, so would the intruder. Her only advantage had been the element of surprise. With the room deathly quiet, she'd lost her edge. She hesitated. Instinct signaled her to stop, to hold off on the lights. The emptiness of the room possessed its own sound. She sensed the trespasser's presence in the air, heavy like an oppressive fog. But something else lingered. What was that smell? A scent washed over her, one she'd missed before. Her anxiety level morphed as the familiar tang touched her awareness. And the thrashing of her heart slowed, replacing fear with anger. You'd better have a real good reason for being here. You could have been shot. Her voice echoed in the darkness. She loosened the tension in her muscles, but kept the gun ready in case she was wrong. Silence. Her fingers tightened on her weapon. Had she been mistaken? Eventually, the faint rustle of material sounded from the study, followed by quiet footsteps on a wooden floor. How did you know I was here? In the dark, the intimacy of the deep voice sent shivers across her skin. Feeling along the bank of electrical switches, she turned the dimmer knob to slowly illuminate the room. The man walked carefully from the study to her right, hands raised shoulder high. Dressed in jeans and a black sweater, Christian Delacourt still wore a brown leather bomber jacket and black gloves, a sign he hadn't been here long. Was I that loud? he asked, his tone unfettered by contrition. Raven had no intention of telling him her secret. Otherwise, he might stop wearing the cologne that teased her senses with a hint of his sensuality. Maybe you're not the only one that can see in the dark, Delacourt. A woman's got to have some element of mystery. Setting her jaw, she demanded, How did you get in here? That's my little mystery. Not good enough, Austin Powers. She didn't care whether he got the cheesy movie reference— her tongue was on automatic pilot. His eyes remained steadfast on hers until they dropped to the weapon she still aimed at his chest. To make a point, she continued the threatening gesture. By the expression on his face, Delacourt looked far too confident for a man in his position. Raven decided it was time for him to learn the error of his ways. "'Turn around. Hands on the wall. Assume the position.' Her voice stern, she jutted her chin and held firm to her thirty-eight, showing she meant business. His jaw dropped. You've got to be kidding. Delacourt stood his ground, hand still, chest high. I rarely kid with a gun in my hand. Now turn around, up against the wall and spread em. She scowled. Just be thankful I'm in a good mood. Gloved hands placed head high against the wall, he leaned and spread his legs. As she expected, the move had been well worth her time. Glancing down to admire the cut of his jeans, she wrestled with a smile. He sighed and dropped his head. Yeah, counting my lucky stars. Now what are you— He gasped when she answered his question with an abrupt move. Stepping closer, she raised his sweater— sliding cold fingers across his bare chest, dawdling along the soft curls of hair spread along his pectorals and down his stomach. 
The warm skin of his taut belly sent a rush of heat to her face. Ah, watch it. He jolted at her touch, his voice cracked faintly. Your hands are cold. Just don't move. I'm not done. Raven fought to keep the mischief from her voice. She retrieved the Glock from his leather holster inside his jacket. Slipping his gun into a pocket of her sweats, she leaned nearer his ear. Nice peace. Rolling his head back, without turning around, he exercised his right to sarcasm. You talking about the weapon? Oh, yeah, that too. Sliding a hand down one thigh, then up his hamstring, she took her time with both legs, dawdling at the small of his back. He never voiced an objection, but fidgeted and huffed as she took liberties with the search. At first, Raven had launched into the arrest procedure without thinking, hoping to impress her authority on him. It should have been an automatic motion. She'd done it countless times. Reaching under his sweater hadn't exactly been an approved search method. She'd improvised that twist to get his attention, keep him off balance. But with Delacourt, the act felt intimate and sensual, as if she'd exploited him and taken unfair advantage. Her intention to drag out his lesson in humility backfired, hitting her squarely between the eyes. Now blood scurried to her face. To his credit, he stood his ground, subjugating himself to her abuse of authority until— I'm not well versed in the arrest process, never having gone through it myself. But aren't you taking a little too much time for the pat-down? he asked. You complaining? The flirtatious retort caught her by surprise. With the men she worked with, a snappy comeback was a requirement of the job. But with Christian, the remark sounded brash. No doubt, dealing with the scum of Chicago had hardened her. Uncertain how to tap into her femininity, she desperately wished for a softer, feminine side to surface. Reality check. Frisking a man at gunpoint would tend to inhibit her womanliness. Granted, the move got the guy's attention, breaking the ice of etiquette, but it lacked subtlety. She closed her eyes for an instant, wondering about her sanity. Maybe she could blame Delacourt. Ever since she'd met him, her world had taken a tumble. Now her cheeks burned. She waited for his reaction to her reckless comeback. You complaining? Her taunt replayed fresh in her mind, making her cringe to think what he'd say. It took him a moment to answer. Then he shook his head and stifled a grin. Looking over his shoulder, he found her eyes. No, no, I'm not. His smile knocked the wind out of her, a sucker punch to the gut, followed by an uppercut inflicted by his dark green eyes. His usually serious expression warmed, softened with humor. Hell, why did he have to smell so damned good? Raven needed to regain control, shift it back to business as usual. Since she'd initiated the detour, it was up to her to get it done. Stepping back, she wiped the grin from her face. Now turn around, slowly. Keep your hands where I can see them. Tilting his head, he kept his hands raised. Don't you think this is a little over the top, even for you? Her gun leveled to his chest. She held her position, then slowly dropped her arms, gun at her side. Is this what you call the spirit of cooperation? I could arrest you, except you'd probably get a perverse enjoyment from the handcuffs. He lowered his hands. His expression held no remorse for the break-in. Quite the contrary. A hint of amusement spread across his face for an instant, then faded. You've caught me red-handed. Nothing to say in my defense. I'm throwing myself on your mercy. With audacity in his eyes, he added, If you have any. Nice apology. You sound like a politician caught with his pants down, she quipped, glaring at him. I figure if it works for the Oval Office, no sense completely reinventing the spiel, he replied without hesitation. Leaning against the door jamb of the study, he folded his arms over his chest in defiance. What? Do I lack sincerity? 
No, I'd say you're full of it. She stepped closer and raised an eyebrow. You trying to charm me into forgetting about your little break-in? No, just keeping up my end of the conversation. His interest in the debate waned, his somber expression reappearing. We could banter all night. Even as entertaining as that might be, I have another idea. Oh, this I gotta hear. You know, this isn't the world of high finance with the Dunhill Corporation. You can't just negotiate your way out of. He interrupted her. I'd like to propose a truce, just for an hour or so. We can cover more ground if we work together. Since neither of us is big on sharing, let's ditch the spirit of cooperation bullshit. You're the one who wanted the cards on the table, so here's my compromise. You're in no position to negotiate anything, Studley. His eyes never wavered. He stepped toward her and closed the gap of her comfort zone. Come on, you came here for a reason. You don't want to hassle with my arrest. That'd just make for a very long evening for both of us. He stared at her, waiting for an acknowledgment she wasn't about to give so easily. So he forged ahead. If we work together and you drop the arrest talk, whatever we find tonight, we share. Deal. Removing a glove, he extended his hand to seal the agreement. Now he turned into Mister Handshake. He turned the tables of getting caught in the act to one of mutual collaboration. Well, no way, Buster. Yet after considering the words he'd chosen about dropping the arrest talk, she wasn't exactly assuring him she wouldn't arrest him at all. It only meant she'd stop talking about it. If it came to snapping on the cuffs, she hoped he'd appreciate the subtle distinction. So where's the compromise, Delacourt? Sounds pretty one-sided to me. I had the displeasure of knowing Mickey. Can you say the same? He challenged. When she found herself mute on the subject, he continued, "And I know computers. While you search the other rooms, I can." Oh no! I've got a specialized forensics team coming in here tomorrow to seize Blair's computer. You're not messing with my chain of custody report for any evidence found on his PC. If we come up with something of interest, I'll consider making a call to you. She glared at him, enjoying her advantage. You haven't exactly given me a warm and fuzzy in the trust department. Mister Subtle let his guard down enough for her to see his resentment. His main purpose for the late night home invasion had undoubtedly been centered on Blair's computer. Given his background, it was one of his specialties. With that not an option, she figured his spirit of cooperation would be in the dumpster. Raven was ready to slam the door shut on him, kicking him out on his delectable ear, but she saw this confrontation as an opportunity, one she couldn't pass up. Tell me why you came here, and not something I already know. With his head down, Christian took a deep breath, deliberating her demand. Walking by her, he finally raised his chin and faced the living area with hands on his hips. She waited for his answer. With barely a glance over his shoulder, he spoke. I think your instincts on Mickey's lifestyle were dead on. He subsidized his income. His closet is filled with designer duds: Armani, Versace, Dolce and Gabbana. And I can't explain it. As head of security, I know his salary. And by tomorrow, you will too. Turning to face her, he reluctantly continued, "We should be looking for a sniper rifle. Knowing Mickey and his field of expertise." That'd be my guess. It would be his style, but who hired him and for what purpose? I have no idea. He hesitated for an instant, then added, "Neither does Fiona. She's in the dark about Mickey's time outside of work. I just spoke to her at home before I came here." At first, his revelation pleased her. Christian admitted much more than she expected. Maybe this little chat had been worth the effort. She believed Mickey Blair to be a strong arm for the Dunhills, but a freelance assassin. Delacourt claimed to be unaware of Mickey's extracurricular activities, but was he? Doubt crept into her speculation. 
If Raven remained objective, she must consider that Christian had just tossed a red herring into the murder investigation. Even if she wanted to believe him, Fiona Dunhill herself may have kept secrets from Delacourt. But why? His voice pulled her back. Now you, tell me something about this investigation I don't already know. His eyes were demanding, yet skeptical. Turnabout was fair play. But had he been honest with her? She'd expected full disclosure from him. Now it was her turn for a sign of good faith. What would she offer? Once again, she trusted her gut instincts regarding the man standing before her. She looked him directly in the eye to emphasize the risk she took. After your little stunt here tonight, I don't owe you anything. After she'd captured his full attention, she began, But I will offer this. You already know Mickey's throat was cut, but there were bruises on his body. We suspect paintball pellets caused the marks. She let the theory register with him. His eyes fogged in reflection. Paintball? Why wasn't there any paint on his clothes? In the photos? He questioned. His surprise appeared genuine, but the man had been insufferably observant. A good quality, if Christian were a solid member of her team. Yet given his past, the man would not change sides so easily. She had to consider him the enemy, or, at the very least, a hostile participant. A part of her remained guarded, so she lied. We don't know what the substance was inside the pellets— all we know is that it wasn't paint. Guess now I understand why I'm top of your hit parade, he grimaced, with a slight shake to his head. Let's not use the word hit in this place, shall we? Gives me the willies. She smiled, then gestured toward the door. Come on, I've had enough entertainment for one night. Give a girl some privacy while she pilfers, will ya? Opening the front door, she made a sweeping gesture with her arm to show him the way out. Once he stepped across the threshold, he turned to ask, My gun? With a sly look, she hesitated, making him wonder what she'd do. Then she reached into the pocket of her sweats and handed him the Glock. I shouldn't have to say this, but maybe you need things spelled out. Yellow tape across the door means stay out, police business. Am I making myself clear? Before he shared his sarcastic wit, Raven beat him to the punch. Wait for an invitation before you invite yourself to my party. I'll remember that. With an unchanging expression, he spoke quietly. Maybe one day I can show you the same hospitality. His words were like a double-edged sword, and his eyes didn't give any particular insight into his meaning. Delacourt clearly preferred ambiguity, so as he walked toward the elevators, she kept her eyes on him. Christian never looked back. The way he moved intrigued her, fluid and commanding as a predator, perhaps just as deadly. Yet with his guard down, when he allowed it to show, his eyes held the promise of kindness and good humor. He was certainly a puzzle. Hearing the elevator arrive, she slowly closed the door and let her mind wander. Stepping into the room, she placed her hands on her hips and stared across the expanse. Finally, she settled on the study door. What had he been doing? Thinking back to when he walked into the foyer, she replayed the moment in her head. Well, I'll be damned. Rushing into the study, she stepped behind the desk her eyes searching for anything out of place. Nothing looked missing. You had your gloves and jacket on, Delacourt. I thought you'd just gotten here. But what if you were just leaving? Damn it, she fumed. If he'd taken anything or been on Blair's computer, she might never know. But then again, she might have caught him in the act like she figured before he'd done any real damage. Setting her jaw, she fought back her indignation. Had she been played for a fool? All the while she'd been posturing her authority, the guy might already have had a lead to follow. Raven remembered the balcony, looking onto the parking lot. If she hurried, she might catch him drive away. 
yanking open the French doors, she stepped toward the balustrade, sticking to the shadows next to a wall. Snow swirled, casting a Norman Rockwell quality to a scene far from an image of Americana. As she expected, Christian stood by a black navigator, the car door ajar, casting a light on him. He stopped. Turning slowly, he looked back toward the building, his eyes looking to the upper floors. Without thinking, she reflexively waved a hand. Raven shook her head, mentally chastising herself for the ridiculous display. Not possible he saw her from this distance and under these conditions, in the dark. You're acting like a schoolgirl, Mac. The man can't see squat, she mumbled. Just as she spoke, Christian raised a hand and returned her wave. A simple gesture. It clutched her heart, caressing her like the tentative fingers of a first-time lover. For an instant, her breath caught in the back of her throat. How the hell do you do that, Christian? she whispered. Her words drifted into the frosty night, a moist vapor trail. Feathery snowflakes wafted to her cheeks and eyelashes, drawn to her warmth. After a long moment, well after he'd pulled from the parking lot, a faint smile curved her lips. And what were you up to? The serrated blade bloodied his plate as he carved into the meat. Slathering the fleshy wedge with steak sauce, he lifted the fork to his mouth. Logan dined alone. His men would eat after him, feasting on a revolting concoction of spaghetti when the dining room had been cleared of his setting. Anything better would be wasted on their crude tastes. He set the rules, including the one about not being interrupted while he dined. Apparently, this rule was subject to interpretation by Vinnie Buck, the man stood at the entryway to the dining room, staring expectantly at him, waiting for a gesture for him to enter. Glaring at his number two man, he continued with his meal, disregarding the rude intrusion. Quietly, Logan chewed every morsel, ignoring the bastard. Only the sound of utensils scraping the plate filled the small room, punctuated by Logan's contentment at his full stomach. He sighed and wiped the corners of his mouth with a linen napkin. Still, Vinny waited. This better be important, Vin. His tone was soft and even, yet clearly filled with contempt. You've disturbed my meal. I'm sorry, Logan, he muttered, stepping into the room with his head lowered. It's just that I thought you want to know. Silence. The idiot expected his prompting. Know what, Vinny? His voice seethed. Fear showed in Vin's eyes, making them bug out of his head like a macabre carnival doll. I accompanied a team to follow both cops like you ordered. The man squirmed, making Logan suspect he'd fucked something up. Such a simple assignment. Leave it to this asshole to mess it up. The man's lower lip trembled as he continued. The team I was on got the job done. We followed the Mexican cop home after the press conference. We know where he lives. But Team 2 waited for Detective McKenzie outside the police station for over an hour. They must have missed her. It was your assignment, Vinny. There is no such thing as they missed her. The failure is clearly yours. Logan stood and tossed the napkin to the table, keeping his eyes on Buck. Without looking down, his left hand found the serrated steak knife. By the look in Vin's eyes, he saw the move, too. Say it. You lost her, right, Vinny? He inched closer and clutched the knife. Before the man stammered his excuses, Logan quickly closed the gap between them. He launched a powerful backhand across the face of the repulsive sycophant. He dropped the man to the floor and knelt on his chest, stifling his breath. Shifting his weight, he dug his knee into fleshy ribs and yanked at the man's hair. Vin yelped. You know how I feel about failure, Vinny. It's simply not an option. The blade became an extension of his threat. He slid the blade tip through the skin of Buck's cheek, leaving a white line. 
blanched skin soon filled with blood. Now, how are we going to rectify the situation? Please, Logan, it won't happen again, he blubbered, his face turning purple. I'll find her, I swear. He gulped air. A tear rolled down his cheek. You failed me, and even after I gave you that hooker. Logan stood and turned his back, leaving Vin to pick himself off the floor. I could have made you wait in line like the rest of my men. Rank has its privileges, Vin. It must. But only if you deserve it. You've taken advantage of my generosity. On his knees, Buck wallowed in guilt as he lowered his head, avoiding his glare. His subservience pleased Logan immensely. I won't fail again, he mumbled, thin strands of blood racing down his cheek. By tomorrow, you'll know where to find Raven Mackenzie. Walking back toward his man, Logan towered over the kneeling Vinny. Laying his hand on Vinny's head, he glanced down, enjoying the feeling of superiority. Tomorrow, then, redeem yourself in my eyes and make me proud. Vin dared to look up, his eyes paying tribute. Yes, sir. A flash of yellow teeth told Logan that all had been forgotten. His lieutenant would not falter. After Vinny left the dining room, Logan returned to his bedroom with a bottle of whiskey and the wife of his latest recruit, Kruger, in tow. The newcomer had made the gesture of offering his woman, hoping to secure favor. And without a doubt, the man had failed to inform her of his generous overture. She now stood in the far corner of his bedroom, trembling in the most delectable fashion. Kruger earned brownie points with every snivel. Although the woman's hair and eyes were dark, that's where the similarities with Raven Mackenzie ended. The pathetic little mouse would never be the caliber of female he deserved. Kruger's woman would soon learn how he handled disappointment. Don't complain to me, woman. I'm not the one passing you around like a party favor. He sighed. You should be grateful. I rarely lower my standards to this degree. Perhaps he'd consider the woman an appetizer to the main course. His mouth watered for the stimulation of Raven Mackenzie. Taking a long pull from the bottle, he downed a slug of liquor, imagining the good detective on her knees before him. Picturing it brought back his consuming rage for vengeance, despite the fact that the detective wasn't technically responsible. In his mind, there was a certain harmony to the idea that she would pay for the sin against him. A whimper drew him back. "'Come here, darling.' he cajoled, not knowing her name. Show Daddy how much you appreciate him giving you and your man a home. She inched closer, her face pallid and frail. Strands of hair draped over her eyes as her chin lowered. When she'd gone as far as she dared, he closed the distance, insinuating himself next to her. Drink, he ordered, handing her the bottle. Purposefully, he kept his expression unreadable, although her eyes searched for indications of his humanity. Finding nothing, she tipped the bottle to her lips out of submissiveness, wincing as the liquor burned her throat. He chuckled as she gagged and offered him the bottle in return, when he wanted so much more. He raised her chin, waiting for her to look up. A shy smile slowly gained momentum on her face. Alcohol raised her hopes. Logan brushed back her hair and stroked a cheek. When he saw the faint essence of adoration brimming in her eyes, he leaned closer. To your knees, woman. After tonight you'll know exactly how to please me. She gasped, choking on her fear. He kissed her cheek, then whispered in her ear, and I expect you to be an energetic pupil. Large tufts of wet snow drifted aimlessly, measured only by the cadence of a clock that gave rhythm to it. 
Christian sat mesmerized by the constant descent, his low spirits magnified by the abundance of white in Mother Nature's assault. The steady barrage accumulated quickly and now started to stick to the windows of his cottage, encasing his world in a silent tomb. The sight provoked his imagination. Cemeteries and crypts were silent, but death screamed its passage, forever seared on the intellect even beyond rational explanation. He'd learned that firsthand. Like a man diseased, he fought back the symptoms of his affliction, struggling to bury the grief so he might function. In the library, a flickering glow from the fireplace bathed the room as he sat at his desk. His mind was only faintly aware of the sedate crackle of the flame, fighting its losing battle against the chill. He favored the dimly lit study with its deep cherry wood paneling and heady smell of books, its furnishings of black leather. It fit his sullen mood, a stark contrast to the cozy, wintry scene beyond the draped windows. Ice cubes shifted, falling against the glass as he drained the last of the liquor. A subtle burn of vintage Macallan scotch branded the back of his throat. The heat warmed his chest, but sapped his strength. It had been one agonizing day. The weight of it played on his mind. Absent-mindedly, he held up his glass, staring through cubes of ice and cut crystal. The blaze refracted through rainbow prisms, distorting his gaze into the hearth. Beep! His computer summoned his attention as it booted. The bright screens launched a kaleidoscope of color onto his face and sweater, barely capturing his fading concentration. His world had been rocked today. Despite that, Raven Mackenzie had insinuated herself into his brain from the moment she'd held him at gunpoint. With all the turmoil plaguing him, he didn't need the added complication. Women always wanted more than he had to give. Eventually, even no-strings lovers deluded themselves into thinking he should feel something in return. They'd all been wrong. He recognized it long ago. Being emotionally crippled, he accepted his lot in life. But a woman like Raven would never understand. She'd want more, and would deserve it. Yet beyond every other impossible rationalization, Raven Mackenzie was a cop. He couldn't allow himself to forget that. Get a grip, Delacourt, he scolded. Keep focused. His fingers moved across the keyboard, pulling up the county tax assessor's database off the Internet. Retrieving the only lead he'd taken from Blair's place, he pulled out the ragged, edged paper from his jeans pocket. Before Detective Mackenzie discovered him in the study, Christian had spotted a spiral notepad by the faint glow of a small flashlight. Flipping the notebook cover, he'd run his fingers over the top page, noticing faint indentations. With a pencil from the desk, he gently rubbed the lead across the lined page. A numbered street address gradually leapt from the page, lifted in reverse like a photographic negative. Not having a crack at Mickey's computer, he had to be satisfied with the only clue to follow. Maybe it meant nothing. 3533 three, three South Giles Avenue, he whispered as he entered the address into the query page of the property database. His only familiarity with the area was that the Dan Ryan Expressway ran through it in the general vicinity of Chinatown. Without delay, he'd gotten a hit on his query. A second screen detailed the property description, map location, and ownership data. The name on the deed left him staring at the screen in disbelief. "'What the hell?' he muttered aloud. "'Why would you have an interest in this place, Mick?' Fiona's words played back in his memory. "'I didn't have him killed, at least not in the way you might imagine.' From her note, he thought she had fled the country from the police, but maybe she had run from him. Had she been afraid of what he might find?' Slumping deeper into his chair, he rocked with his eyes closed. His mind played tug-of-war with his emotions. He loved Fiona like a mother, but if she had ordered Blair killed, would he cover up her crime? Could he walk away from the truth? 
Too tired to dwell on Fiona's sins, he pushed his doubts aside. He'd have to obtain more information on the property before taking the next step. A visit was in order, but he needed more intel before he barged into a facility unannounced. More from instinct, his eyes fell to the weapon lying on his desk, lodged in its holster. He'd be armed in case he ran into trouble. Hitting the print icon, he downloaded and printed the map. Glancing at a wall clock, his eyes blurred in fatigue. Already after midnight. Given his drive into the city at dawn, another long day loomed ahead. The police would be at Dunhill Tower by eight. But after they left, he would visit the Giles Avenue location. With any luck, he'd be ahead of Raven Mackenzie and her partner in his own investigation. It might be all the advantage he'd need to protect Fiona's secret. Chapter 5 A terrifying blast jarred him from a dead sleep, echoing over and over. The deafening crack of wood shook the walls, threatening to collapse the room around him. Disoriented, he covered his face, unsure where he was until a loud rumble overloaded his senses. The menacing sound escalated, careening straight for him. Like a haunting déjà vu, he'd been forced to witness the chronicle being played out. "'Chicago police!' a man shouted. "'Come out with your hands up!' Sitting bolt upright in bed, he clutched the layers of blankets to his chest. His eyes searched the darkness, finding nothing to give him comfort. "'What's happening?' he wanted to shriek, but words wouldn't come. He opened his mouth to cry out. Nothing. His heart cleaved to the effort, strangling his will to make any sound at all. At the base of his bedroom door, eerie lights ebbed and flowed amidst the screams and the ear-splitting eruption of macabre fireworks like the Fourth of July. Yet despite the utter chaos outside the room, he stayed rooted where he sat, unable to move. He fought his body, wanting to react to the threat but he felt bound to a course of action as if he followed a script. Then the voices came, the beginning of the end. His gut twisted with the sound. No, please, we are unarmed. Stop! He'd never heard the man's voice so filled with fear. A loud crash made his heart leap. Something heavy hit the floor. Not my little girl! A woman screamed. Oh, my God! No! This voice was familiar, too, but his brain resisted the recollection in complete denial. Another thunderous pop, and her wailing ended. Outside his door, heavy footsteps stumbled toward him. Now I lay me down. The steady mantra spewed from his lips, sounding foreign to his ear. Like a marionette acting upon the commands of a puppeteer, he repeated lines he'd heard before. He stared into the murky void, not recognizing the voice of a child in prayer. The words resonating in his head should have been comforting. Instead, they triggered a deep-rooted warning. They were coming for him. In desperation to discover more, he garnered all his strength. Then, as weightless as a feather, much to his surprise, he lifted himself to look down upon a small boy. Although the child was faintly recognizable, his face distorted in terror and challenged his recollection. "'Pray the Lord, keep my soul,' the boy muttered. The words tumbled from the kid's mouth, the meaning distorting in his brain. Over and over the child repeated fragments of the prayer— now I pray. Soul to keep. A dark motion to his right caught his eye. The kid saw it, too. A shadow eclipsed a glimmer of light. Someone was outside the room. To protect the boy, he once again infused himself into the small body without thinking, hoping to give the child a fighting chance to survive. Instead, the boy's horror assaulted him, strangling rational thought with sheer hysteria. If I should die. The words came faster. His throat clenched with fear, cutting off his air. "'Please, God!' he pleaded. 
The small body rocked back and forth, his voice raspy. Tears spilled from his eyes. Still, he couldn't make the child move. Another explosion ripped a hole through the door, jolting him from his stupor. A low, agonizing moan filled the darkness, sounding like a man who stood near the foot of the bed. It took his panicked brain a moment to realize he was still alone with the child until someone leaned heavily on the door, scratching faintly to get in, rattling the doorknob. The child screamed. Suddenly, the bedroom door flew open. A tall hulk of a man stood, then staggered toward the boy, the massive silhouette backlit by erratic flashes of light. The old man's got a gun, someone yelled from far away. Where's the kid? We came for the boy. Find him. Strangers' voices droned in the background, mixing with the shrill sound of a distant police siren. But like the child's, his complete attention had been drawn to the faceless shadow standing before him. A distinct smell swept into the room. A strange, sweet odor dominated his nostrils. The boy gasped, sucking in the metallic tang. Enveloped by the peculiar aroma, he felt his body and mind slow down, as if someone stalled the pace of a movie reel, clacking frame by frame. Shadow Man seized the kid's arm in a vice-like grip, grappling for him under the blankets. He fought his attacker, armed only with the cooperation of the child, blindly flailing thin arms and kicking gangly legs. No, let me go! He cried, his tone throaty and lethargic, every syllable distinct and drawn out. Now I lay me. Down, the man spoke. He strained to understand the words, but like the boy, his mind felt numb with urgency. Only a garbled sound trickled through his awareness, drowned out by the prayer. Pray my soul to keep. His body rocked violently, struggling for freedom. His chest on fire. Trapped in the defenseless body, he fought for freedom, if for no other reason than to defend the boy. Helpless, locked in frailty, he was paralyzed. He could only watch the tragedy occur over and over again, sinking in the quagmire of slow motion. If I should die before I wake, dizziness threatened to betray him. Bile rose hot from his belly, tangled in his blankets. He shut his eyes and shrieked. His voice blended with that of the child. God help us, please. God help me, he shouted. Please. He no longer heard the boy. Only his voice remained. As the nightmare faded, the scene morphed into indistinct shapes. Drenched in sweat, Christian threw a pillow across the room, knocking over a lamp. The crash only punctuated the terror he'd relived, embellishing the memory of a ten-year-old boy. His lungs burned with the exertion. Amidst dank sheets, he sat trembling in the dark, an adrenaline rush surging through his veins. God hadn't heard him then, just as he turned a deaf ear to the adult Christian had become. Oh God, he whispered, make it stop. Still, the blind eye of God left his call for help unanswered. With a pain so fresh, it wasn't much consolation that he lived on the Dunhill estate now. His mind mercifully fast-forwarded to the present. The small house he'd lived in as a child had been demolished long ago, obliterating the last vestige of the heinous police action. So his memory, hazy at best, was all that remained. Staring through the gloom, Christian found everything as it should be, except for one overturned light fixture. A single nightlight burned, a ritual from childhood. It had been years since he'd been tortured by that nightmare. Having his past churned up had been the catalyst. Christian glanced over his shoulder to the clock on the nightstand. He'd been in bed only a few hours. He knew attempting sleep now would be futile. 
In complete exhaustion, he fell back onto a pillow, wiping a hand across his damp brow. His bare skin prickled with the chill of realization. The remnants of the nightmare clutched at him as his lungs fought for air. Unyielding, the hellish images flashed like a strobe light through his mind. Dead eyes of familiar faces stared back, demanding answers that might never come. Their cries for justice penetrated the black body bags, seeking him out even now. He stared blindly at the ceiling. The lingering details of the dream faded despite his best effort to recall them. Still, one thought remained. Where's the kid? We came for the boy. Find him. The words leapt from his memory like a harsh slap in the face. It had been the first time he remembered hearing them, and the recollection stayed. Normally, such details would be wiped from the slate the moment he awakened from the nightmare. What did it mean? It must be significant. Damn it, why couldn't he remember? Christian struggled for every shattered image. Often in the silence, he strained to recall, all the while dreading the journey to relive it. More times than not, his memory was tainted with the terror of his family's final screams, abruptly ending his grisly pilgrimage. He blocked out so much. Only after extensive therapy and hypnosis did he discover his deepest regret, the time he spent fighting the shadow man. Ultimately, the man proved to be his savior. Chapter 6 Dunhill Tower, Downtown Chicago The Dunhill Corporation shadowed Michigan Avenue, a monolith in glass and granite, acclaiming the amassed wealth of the family holdings. Raven had walked by it many times, never giving the notable family a thought. Standing at a crosswalk with her partner by her side, huddled with the masses, she burrowed into her overcoat. Her eyes fixed upon the gray morning sky, then trailed the height of the tower until it dissolved into the low-lying clouds. Unlike her, Tony didn't appreciate the courtesy of being prompt. By her watch, it was five till eight, and they were on foot, still a good five blocks away. Although, technically, they weren't late at this very minute, it would be inevitable nonetheless. In her mind, she imagined the unspoken judgment on Delacorte's face. The guy probably shot from his mother's womb precisely on time, right down to the split second. "'You're antsy this morning. What's up?' Tony asked. The light changed, and they crossed the street. "'Nothing. We're going to be late.' She stuffed her hands into her pockets. "'You know how much I hate that.' "'Yeah, kind of an endearing quality,' he chuckled. "'Just like I hope my procrastination is to you.' Everything about you is endearing, partner. Now shut up and keep moving. She smiled. I got my heart set on a big cup of joe. I bet designer boy has good taste in Java. The muffled sound of a cell phone summoned her. Reaching into a coat pocket, she answered the call. Yeah, Mackenzie here. To listen, she plugged an ear with a finger, keeping pace with Tony. Hey, Raven. Scott Farrell. We got an analysis off the GCMS, the trace evidence on the Blair case. Raven was familiar with the acronym. The gas chromatograph mass spectrometer was a machine used to analyze material and trace evidence. She didn't have to understand how it worked, just that it did. True to his word, Farrell had promised a rush analysis and delivered. The man read through a litany of scientific particulars. Interrupting him, Raven wanted to cut to the chase. So, bottom line, what are we looking at, Scott? Two main points. There was evidence of rust and paint on his hands, but what's interesting is the content of the paint. It was lead-based, indicating an older structure painted before 1978. An old building in Chicago. That should stand out big time, she joked. At the front entrance to the Dunhill Tower, Tony pushed through the revolving glass door, with her on his heels. 
Once inside, they stood amidst a lavish leather seating area under the close scrutiny of the security staff at a circular kiosk. That's why they pay you the big bucks, Mac. Farrell laughed. But remember, I said there were two notable items. The second one may help make your job easier. I'm listening. The list of compounds I read off. We found them on his clothes and hands, but they boiled down to one thing: ammunition. She took a moment to digest his assessment. So. We are looking for an older building, perhaps used to store or make munitions. That'd be my guess," he replied. "Aren't some of those components considered controlled substances?" she asked, searching her memory. "Or some kind of hazardous waste?" Yeah, prior to a federal law enacted in the late seventies, treatment of ordnance waste wasn't tracked. Components used in explosives, as well as solvents and fuels, are reported more thoroughly now. But I know where you're headed. We have access to a property database that we could query on the munitions components, maybe get a hit on ownership of record. Since it's a fairly recent resource, I'm not sure we'll have luck on any buildings that old. It's going to be a long shot. Well, you're talking to a Cubs fan. Long shots are what I do. She couldn't help but grin, thinking of her father. Just give it your best. Maybe we'll get lucky. I'll check back with you. Give me an hour or two, he added. Later, Mac. Thanks for pushing on this one. She ended the call and glanced at Tony, lowering her voice. Another coincidence just hit us broadside, my fine friend. Seems the trace evidence on Blair is related to munitions. She raised an eyebrow, and with the Dunhills rumored to be involved with illegal arms trading, I think Fiona Dunhill is neck deep in this, up to her cultured pearl necklace. You'd think Christian Delacourt is running interference for her? He asked, anticipating her thoughts precisely. Raven had kept her midnight rendezvous with Delacourt a secret from her partner. For what purpose, she didn't fully understand. Not sure she really wanted to, but in light of this new information, she had to face facts. Christian Delacourt was anything but an ally. Could be, partner. She speculated, shrugging out of her coat. I think we should call on Mrs. Dunhill while we're here, and my gut tells me we should stick close to Delacourt. Whether he knows more than he's letting on, I don't know. But the man might be worth the effort. She stared across the room, her eyes not settling on anything in particular, lost in thought. Worth the effort? Tony questioned, humor coloring his expression. Her partner had an annoying habit of actually listening. Had she said he'd be worth the effort? Delacourt had definitely gotten under her skin. Would it take a radical surgical procedure to remove the two hundred pound growth? If only it were that simple. Tony waited for an answer. To cover up her faux pas, she replied, "I think we should stick close to the guy. That's all I'm saying. And given the arrangements today, I've got an idea on how we can do that." Christian discovered the Giles Avenue property belonged to a division of Dunhill Corporation. By all accounts in the company files, the old armory was a historic site, abandoned long ago. So why did Mickey have the address written on a notepad at his home? Like playing a game of connect the dots, a link between Mickey and Fiona had been made with one easy stroke. The thought disturbed him, especially without Fiona here to explain the reason. Now where would this lead him? All he could think about was checking out the old building. But one thing loomed on his horizon before he left on his personal errand: Detective Raven Mackenzie. Swiveling his desk chair, he stood and walked toward the large picture window across his office. A console table had been set up with a coffee service and a modest serving of fruit and pastries for the visitors he expected. The thought of food turned his stomach, but the coffee was another story. Christian refilled his third cup of coffee since arriving at six. Slowly, he sipped the dark, pungent brew, letting the steam rise to his lips.
A fog drifted off the lake, clouding the view. It tinged his somber mood with the blues. Adrift in the haze, his eyes probed the gloom as if he waited for an answer to emerge. No such luck. His phone rang, pulling him from his funk. He glanced at his watch. Ten after eight. He suspected his guests from CPD had arrived, exhibiting their propensity for tardiness. Reaching his desk, he read the caller ID display, Lobby Security. Yes, he answered. Mr. Delacourt, Burke here. You have two guests from the Chicago police here to see you. They have an appointment? Yes, send them to my office. Their appointment is with human resources, but I'll see them first. Give me ten minutes with them, then have someone from HR come to escort them. After he hung up, a strange feeling gripped him. The dark eyes of Raven Mackenzie dominated his thoughts, along with the memory of her velvet touch against his belly. He found himself anxious to see her. With a slight shake of his head, he glared at the closed door to his office, chastising his foolishness. Damn it, Delacourt, you've got work to do. The executive offices of the Dunhill Tower were beautifully appointed. Endless corridors were lined in plush rugs, adding texture and warmth to the lofty ornate ceilings, dripping with extravagant chandeliers. Framed in gold, massive canvases hung low on paneled walls, with subtle lighting to accentuate the vivid oils. The heady scent of fresh exotic flowers teased her senses, their elaborate arrangements surpassing the elegance of distinctive porcelain vases. Raven had never seen such fine decor. She attempted to look nonchalant, but Tony gave them both away, openly gawking with his mouth open. Ay, Dios mío, Raven! Check this place out. If I were here, I'd want to bring in a mattress. Stay a while. Tony spun around, absorbing the ambience with all the finesse of a ball-peen hammer. If Delacourt doesn't turn out to be a heartless, cold-blooded killer, you think he might hire me for a security team? That is, when I get ready to retire from the life? And why would you be so picky as to exclude a murderer from your future employment prospects? She joked. Excellent point, Mac. Maybe I shouldn't limit my potential. Interrupting Tony's delusions, the receptionist greeted them. Good morning, detectives. May I take your coats? The young petite brunette flashed a brilliant smile as they handed over their garments. Mr. Delacourt is expecting you. Right this way. Stylishly dressed, the woman ushered them to a suite toward the right. We have coffee and pastries inside. Compliments of Dunhill. Have a nice day. The sound of a delicate, high-pitched violin found its way to her ear from speakers well hidden. Classical music gave an air of serenity to the workplace. All of it. So civil. The woman pushed open the massive door to Christian's office. As they entered, she announced, Your guests are here. Anything else I can get you, Mr. Delacourt? No, Denise, that's all. Thanks for indulging me this morning. My pleasure, Christian. The use of his first name, coupled with the inviting look in her eyes, told Raven that Christian had indeed been her pleasure. Only another woman would recognize the coy move, yet Delacourt appeared oblivious to her blatant flirtations. Raven knew his affairs were none of her business. Instead, she drank in the sight of him like she'd been wandering the desert for days without water. Dressed in an elegant navy suit, pale blue shirt, and a tasteful tie in red silk print, Christian Delacourt stole her breath. A constant habit. Accentuating his tall, lean stature, the drape of his suit fit his body perfectly. The subtlety of his cologne embraced her. And as a welcome bonus, the feel of his skin teased her sense of touch, reminding her she'd taken liberties with him last night. She fought to hide a smile as she approached him. Would he acknowledge his little escapade of breaking and entering into Mickey Blair's place last night in front of Tony? Raven didn't have to think about that for long. He'd be a fool to admit he'd broken the law. One thing was very certain. 
Christian Delacourt would never be mistaken for a fool. Drawing closer, Raven noticed the pale blue of his shirt tinted his green eyes to a blend of deep azure. She'd always believed such perfection would be unattainable, featured only on exotic magazine covers using enhanced photographic techniques. Yet here stood living proof she'd been wrong. Only the ever-present sadness in his expression reminded her his life was anything but perfect. Christian communicated all this in an instant, but perhaps she read too much into him again—a dangerous yet tantalizing addiction with a man like Delacourt. He caught her eye and held her gaze long enough to communicate a special recognition. Then the flash was gone. Christian reverted to business as usual. Good morning, detectives. He shook hands with them both, then offered, "I hope you like the coffee and feel free to enjoy the fruit and pastries. Someone from HR will be here shortly to escort you to your morning appointment." Tony served himself a pastry and filled a china cup with coffee, looking back over his shoulder at his host. Well, we appreciate your hospitality. The spread looks great. But before we head over to HR, we'd like to see Mrs. Dunhill to thank her personally. Oh, no need for thanks, Detective Rodriguez. I assure you. Christian's face was unreadable. No, we insist. Raven asked, "Is she in today?" His eyes fixed on her. Actually, I'm not sure. I left the estate early. I didn't discuss her itinerary for the day. My, isn't that unusual for the head of security to be out of the loop? If she hadn't been watching intently, she might have missed the subtle change in his expression. Playing cagey with Delacourt felt like challenging a grand chess master. That was more of a rhetorical question, just a general observation. I'm sure Fiona Dunhill is in very capable hands. She'd intended to make a point, but his sentiments shone on his face. Her insincere attempt to make amends fell flat. Are you always this obsessed with expressing your gratitude, Detective Mackenzie? His eyes demanded an answer. That question is not rhetorical. I'm quite interested in understanding the proper etiquette for coffee and cheese Danish. Brick by brick, Christian erected a wall between them, using sarcasm for mortar, and she had only herself to thank for initiating the verbal tussle. We may have some questions to ask her. Loaded with nerve, she implied a skepticism for his version of the truth. You may have some questions. My, isn't that unusual for a detective to be so ambiguous? I haven't known you for very long. But aren't you a bit more direct? Definitely on the assault, Delacourt found high ground and intended to hold it. Then how's this for direct? We want to talk to Mrs. Dunhill. How can we find her? She folded her arms and stepped closer. Try her cell phone. I'm sure she'll be happy to make arrangements with you when you speak to her. Walking to his desk, Christian pulled open a drawer. He wrote on the back of a small card, "My business card." Her private cell phone number is on the back. Rejoining her, he handed over the card along with a heaping dose of cynicism. Please be discreet with the use of it. Discreet, I can do discreet. She qualified, or a fair facsimile. Subtlety is not a word I would associate with you, detective. Hearing a soft knock at the sweet door, Christian excused himself. I believe that is your next appointment. I'm sorry to cut short our visit. Pardon me. The man was an odd mixture of absolute appeal and outright frustration, bundled up in a delectably dangerous package. A part of her felt hopping mad, but mostly she enjoyed the challenge. Raven watched Delacourt step away to greet the representative from HR. Her eye caught Tony in the midst of a chuckle. He'd found a comfortable seat on a nearby sofa and was wiping his mouth with a napkin. She hadn't even picked up a plate, having time only to sip her coffee. But his dish and cup were empty. 
This has definitely been entertaining, and I got a front row seat. It just don't get any better than this. Tony shook his head, still amused. I sincerely hope Delacour is not our guy. The way he pushes your buttons, it's worth the price of admission. Haven't you ever heard of bad cop, good cop? She teased. Yeah, but not sure bad cop, hungry cop plays as well. He cleared his throat to stifle his laughter, then volunteered, "Let me give him the good news that he's stuck with you for a while longer. He's gonna love our divide and conquer tactic." Divide and conquer. What had she been thinking? Her instincts told her to stick with him. The man was hiding something. It wouldn't be easy to extract it from him, especially not with Tony in plain sight. And with the secret they shared, her unexpected rendezvous with Christian at Blair's, Raven might have a chance to question him on the subject. So she'd proposed Tony take the HR appointment, leaving her alone with Delacourt. Her partner agreed, reiterating his thoughts on her influence over Delacourt. Influence wouldn't be her first choice of words, yet she had to admit she consistently got a reaction from the guy. Now, if only she could control her reaction to him, alone with Christian Delacourt, she didn't know what to make of her good fortune. One thought stuck in her brain: every silver lining possessed a dark cloud, and without the stormy, unruly cloud, the silver lining wouldn't stand out as anything special. At least, that's what she told herself. When had she become so philosophical? And so accepting of bull-headed storm clouds, Christian thought he'd be rid of his guests so he could get on with his day. All they had to do was accompany the HR rep. He should have known Detective Mackenzie would find a way to spoil his plans. Now he'd have to improvise. After all, the woman had ventured onto his turf at Dunhill. The advantage was his, or so he thought. Staring across the room at his tenacious visitor, he recalled the old adage about best laid plans. While her partner headed off to human resources, the willful Raven Mackenzie remained behind. Now, closing the door to his office, he was alone with her. Innocently smiling, she sat on his sofa, hands on her lap, as if she awaited him to entertain her. Nothing could be further from the truth. Dressed in dark gray slacks and an oversized ivory turtleneck sweater, she'd pulled her dark hair back into a ponytail, looking elegant in her simplicity. A small part of him wished they'd met under different circumstances, that his whole life had been different. But such maudlin thinking served no purpose. He joined her in a chair near the sofa. Without fanfare, the detective spoke first. "You didn't sleep well." It wasn't a question. He searched her eyes, surprised to discover concern. It stirred him. After their earlier verbal jousting, he hadn't expected such a personal remark. Surprisingly, her presumption felt like comfort that someone knew him well enough to confront him. So many people in his life left him alone, taking for granted his complete control. His pensive demeanor and aloofness sent a clear message by design. Yet, with her boldness, Raven insinuated herself into his narrow circle of acquaintances. He should have resented her forwardness, but instead he liked the way it felt. With the precision of a laser, her dark eyes easily cut through the wall he directed, as if it were constructed of warm butter. Fearlessly and without effort, she debated him in her quiet way. The intimacy in her voice touched him. Sleep is overrated, he replied matter-of-factly, trying not to betray himself. And it's for those who earn the right to it. Avoiding her stare, he focused on the crumbs of pastry on the discarded plate of Detective Rodriguez. For most people, his response would have ended the subject, but not with Raven. The woman calmly persisted. Hardly, I've seen stone-cold killers sleep like babes. She reached across and touched his arm. He could no longer avoid the woman. Her gaze held him as she spoke softly. 
I believe a different kind of hell keeps you awake, and it's one I may know a little something about. If you ever want to talk— The woman had done her research. Now the look of concern made sense. He'd seen pity in her eyes, one of many reasons he avoided sharing himself with anyone. Pity was inevitable. Look, I appreciate your concern, but I don't need— He stopped mid-sentence, hearing how he sounded. Her intentions were good, but most people had no idea of the living hell he'd endured. Thanks. It's something I've lived with for a very long time. Not sure I'd know how to talk about it. But I appreciate the offer. My invitation still stands. I mean it. Once again she squeezed his arm reassuringly, not backing down. He nodded, his only reply to her invitation. He needed a change in subject. Mickey had an office on five and a gym locker in the basement. I'm sure you'd like to get on with your investigation. Shall we? As the detective stood and walked toward the door to his suite, Christian found himself wishing Raven met his expectation for a cop. It'd make resisting her so much easier. And for what he had in mind to reclaim his day, he hoped she had a sense of humor. He ditched me, damn it! Raven grabbed Tony by the elbow as he exited the men's room on the twentieth floor near the Dunhill Human Resources area. I turned my back for only a second and he pulled a fast one, switched places with one of his security men. You mean he found a way to resist your feminine wiles? Amazing, Mac. He pulled away, facing her with a look of indignation. Hey, did you follow me? How did you know I was in the men's room? How long have we been partners, Tony? I could set my watch by your morning constitutional. She smirked, temporarily setting aside her problems with Delacorte to tease her friend. Without much discretion, he tucked the sports section of the paper under his arm. Well, you'd know the expression. A man's gotta do what a man's gotta do. He grinned. So you lost him, huh? Narrowing her eyes, she paced in front of him along the corridor. She gathered her thoughts, chewing the inside of her lip. As far as I can tell, he's not in the building. Believe me, I asked and searched a few floors. Leaning against the nearest wall, she crossed her arms over her chest. And it seems Mrs. Dunhill is a wall. I can't raise her on the cell phone Delacourt gave, and she's not in the building, according to security. But they weren't exactly helpful, if you catch my meaning. That's because we don't sign their paychecks. He offered his explanation with a shrug. I'm beginning to think this whole cooperation thing with the Dunhills has run its course. The chief won't want to hear that, but as I see it, we got an investigation to conduct. What say we grab our coats and blow this joint? I'm with you, pal, she agreed, and accompanied him down the hall toward the elevators. What did you find out? Well, I got some general information on our Vic, but nothing to shed any light on his extracurriculars, other than to make it painfully obvious the man was moonlighting. His salary didn't support the lifestyle he led, not enough jack to pay for all his bling. And what about you? Find anything worth knowing? With her partner's question, Raven recalled the only high point of her search. Blair's office held few personal items, no photos or special mementos. The man had been a ghost at Dunhill, purposefully keeping his private life apart from his work. Considering Mickey had a more lucrative business venture outside Dunhill, this didn't surprise her. It looked as if she'd come up empty on any leads. But catching a glint under his desk changed all that. The waning sun had shone through Blair's former office window for only an instant, shedding some much-needed light. As she'd shoved a drawer closed and pushed back from the desk, a glimmer caught the fleeting rays of sunshine. Kneeling for a closer look, she'd crawled under for a better view and made a discovery. After punching the down button on the elevator panel, she turned toward Tony, holding her bonanza. I found a key, Tony. 
At eye level, she held up a plastic bag with a small silver key dropped inside. It was on a ring along with the rest of his desk keys, inserted in a lock, just dangling there. It stood out from the rest because it was a little longer. Longer is noticed a lot. Trust me, he teased with an exaggerated roll of his eyes. Even though most women won't say it to your face. Well, this woman notices things like that. She grinned, letting him infer what he wanted from her remark. So I compared the lock number to the ID on the keys and found that the longer one didn't match the set. That Mickey was a sly dog hiding it in plain sight like that. Did you happen to find a home for that key? Tony asked. The elevator door opened and they stepped inside. Not yet. It didn't fit anything in his office or his personal Dunhill locker. But I'm going to ask around, see if anyone knows about a place outside of work that he could have had a locker or office. Once on the ground floor, bundled in her coat, Raven stopped at the front security kiosk to check out of the building. Let's grab a bite to eat on our way back. Raven's cell phone chimed, stopping her in mid-sentence. Mackenzie here, talk to me. Hey, Raven, it's Scott. Got something interesting on that property search. Looks like your long shot paid off in spades. The CSI man joked. Tell me something good, my friend. We got a download of properties, but there was one that stood out from the rest: an old armory belonging to the Dunhill Corporation. Any bells going off for you? Loud and clear. She reached into her purse and pulled out a pad and pen to jot down the information. Give me the address. Tony's voice droned in the background as he grabbed the notepad from her hand. He was on his cell, calling in the information so authorization would be granted to enter the vacant property. Thinking ahead, he wanted a jump on the paperwork while they made their way back to the station house. I owe you one, buddy. Thanks. Raven finished her call, then turned to her partner. Guess we can forget lunch for now, partner. We got places to be and things to do. But her mood quickly changed. Stepping up her pace with Tony by her side, Raven tuned everything out, thinking only of Delacourt as she navigated the busy thoroughfare. She had a bad feeling that Christian was involved in Fiona's mess. How much did he know? He had deliberately ditched her earlier. She was sure of it. How far would he go to protect Fiona's interests, or worse, cover up a crime he committed? Her stomach twisted in a knot, just examining the many questions in her mind. Could she have been that wrong about him? Even more disturbing, why did she care? Don't borrow trouble. Tony's voice brought her back to the steady hum of traffic. What? My mother always used to say that when she thought I was worrying over something I had no control over. He ventured, "Don't borrow trouble, Raven. Let's just see what we see, okay?" She stopped for a moment to search his eyes, then smiled. How did I get to be so lucky having a partner like you? He works in mysterious ways. Tony offered, surprised by the reference. Raven asked, "Who? God?" No, the chief. Same difference. Tony laughed. It reminded her how much she loved her partner. The limousine rolled quietly through the shabby neighborhood with the full-bodied sound of an orchestra playing faintly over the speakers nearest his ear. Music fortified his tolerance, but did nothing for his disdain at the squalor. He had no sympathy. There would always be poor. How else would civility stand out if not for the dregs of society? His voice resounded off the glass pane. Boredom tainted his tone. Gazing through the window, Nicholas Charbonneau bore witness to the depth of disgrace, as if it were a boorish documentary unfolding. He distanced himself from it. On the surface, a thin shield of bulletproof glass insulated him from the rest of humanity. Yet so much more distinguished him from the multitudes. Slender, pale fingers slid down his thigh, 
long red nails glistening, the scent of exotic spice wafted by him. Turning, he met her eyes. For as long as he'd known her, touch had been her preferred way of communicating. She quietly observed life when it suited her, but her sultry voice beckoned his complete attention. You forget yourself, Nikki. Remember, you thrive on the misfortune of others. Do not now condemn them. Elegantly dressed, the petite woman at his side wore a silk dress of midnight blue. Her coat tossed onto the seat. Her dark hair was pulled loosely from her face, accentuating her slender neck and delectable jawline. Because she was of Chinese descent, her serene dark eyes masterfully slanted, giving her a mysterious and intelligent quality. Flawless skin reminded him of creamery butter. His young bodyguard was exquisite, and quite deadly. You know me well. And you are most correct, dear one. I can attribute my livelihood to the weaknesses of others. In theory, I should celebrate their adversity. Good-naturedly, he laughed at her bold observation. Being the heir to a crime family, he often found himself surrounded by people who guarded their true opinion. They told him only what they thought he wanted to hear. Not Jasmine Lee. She always spoke her mind. He remembered how they'd met, and it always brought a smile to his lips. Glancing down at her delicate hands, he remembered the time that he'd witnessed those graceful fingers taking a life when she was barely out of her teen years. In a rough area of downtown Chicago, he'd accompanied a rather shady friend to some forgettable jazz club. Not much remained in his memory of that night, except for the vivid details of Jasmine. The man had been many times her size and looked as if he had instigated the confrontation. In actuality, she had quietly spurred him on and wielded a knife to make her point. For her part and two witnesses, it would appear to be self-defense, but he recognized premeditation when he saw it. And he'd noticed with admiration that fear never once shadowed her face. The attack was over almost before it began, and she never hesitated to do what had to be done. But it wasn't her efficiency that piqued his interest. It was the essence behind her enigmatic eyes, vessels brimming with a lust for life and death. She seemed to enjoy the kill. Such a rare and valuable quality in an employee, much less one so beautiful. Yet she held her vulnerability restrained, not letting it show until later. She had killed the man for a sin he had committed against her family. It wasn't until later that she told him the whole story, and he admired her all the more. The adrenaline rush compelled him to act, to take her into his life and eventually hire her. Yet a deeper desire to harness her savagery, for his own benefit, drew her into his inner circle, and into his bed. Her loyalty knew no bounds. We're almost there, Mantis. His affectionate nickname for her brought a graceful curve to her lips, pleasing him immensely. The female praying mantis always devoured the head of the male in the throes of copulation. He often wondered if the male of the species believed such sacrifice to be worth the extra effort. I apologize for subjecting you to this unpleasant business. As soon as we conclude this distasteful interlude, I shall make it up to you over dinner. Just being in your company comforts me, Nicky. Nicky. Prior to Jasmine, it had been many years since someone had called him by that name. His bodyguard and confidant had no idea that the nickname engendered many bittersweet memories in him. Only one other person called him Nicky, and he had already taken a course of action to destroy a woman he still loved. Memories flooded his mind back to his early twenties. A lifetime ago. 
Feeling like Romeo to her Juliet, Nicholas couldn't resist a young woman named Fiona Fitzgerald. In her late teens, she'd captivated his complete attention during an intermission in the opera La Bohème. Her lithe form made even more beautiful by the white beaded gown she wore. Although their affair had been torrid from the start, it was all too brief, cut short by her arranged betrothal to Charles Dunhill, the heir apparent of a rival crime family to his own. He never understood why she chose another, especially since he felt so sure she loved him. Fortified by the invincibility of youth, he begged her to marry him instead, in total disregard of his own safety. For her love, he'd been willing to wage war against his rival, but in the end, she refused to see him, not giving him the satisfaction of an answer. His throat clenched with the memory. But his Fiona gave him a precious gift, something her husband would never claim. Given such innocence, no gift ever touched him quite as much. Despite his feelings for her, Nicholas had seen Fiona become his new rival after the unsolved murder of her husband. Conducting his own investigation of the assassination, he'd found the chink in the Dunhill armor and discovered his lover had grown a spine and a ruthless nature. To not take advantage of such an opportunity would have been foolish, and he no longer considered himself a foolish young man. Business was business. Drawing him back to the present, the late afternoon sun stabbed through the gray clouds and warmed his face through tinted windows. Even with dark glasses, he squinted against the light, catching his image in the glass when the sun cooperated. His dark hair, infused with gray at the temples, glistened in the light. The deep blue of his eyes flashed in the warm rays, even under his designer frames. He had changed from the man Fiona knew. Time and cynicism had weathered him. Yet in spite of being in his late fifties, he still garnered the attention of women, even before they discovered his identity. His reputation as a powerful and wealthy man drew them like bees to warm honey, augmented even more by his notoriety as an accomplished lover. He'd cultivated his celebrity over the years on all fronts. But he had never proposed marriage to any woman other than Fiona, preferring his solitude to anything second best. Perhaps some entertainment might distract you. Jasmine's soft voice kept him from falling victim to his memories. Her gaze directed him elsewhere. I know how you are so easily bored. A motion to his left snared his attention to a darkened corner of the vehicle. A drama played silently on a small television. A DVD looped images that served to inspire him. Scene after scene of death played out before his eyes. Even now, a pride of lions devoured a wildebeest, their muzzles red with blood from a successful hunt, their half-lidded eyes satiated with the kill. The brutality made a mockery of the classical music lilting in the background. Yet such was his paradoxical life, the exhilarating adrenaline rush of his criminal endeavors, tempered by the civility he favored. He had been truly blessed and cursed. Yes, you understand me indeed, he muttered under his breath, not taking his eyes off the screen. No pretext of love existed between him and Jasmine. They filled a need in each other that no one else understood, and she knew merely what he allowed her to know. Only one woman understood his softer underbelly. It had been the last time he felt so vulnerable to another living soul. Love was a weakness, and it had been a painful lesson indeed. Dismissing his unsettling reflections, he watched the drama played out on the screen. A cheetah slowly stalked a herd of gazelle in search of the weakest, a fine example of Darwin's theory on survival. Terror in the eyes of prey infused him with a sense of power as menacing death pursued its next victim. 
truly an inspiration. Yes, he'd never feel vulnerable again. His driver slowed and turned on to another side street. He glanced at his watch, just past three. If this had been a peer in his social circle, he would have been embarrassed by his own tardiness. But he planned to meet with one of his more depraved contractors, a necessary evil in his line of work. Logan McBride could wait. The man was a bleak illustration of how much he'd changed over the years. Harnessing a beast like McBride reminded him of the power broker he'd become, one of the many reasons he minimized face-to-face -face meetings with the man. The limo turned right and entered a cyclone-fenced parking lot near a warehouse. Standing by a loading dock, McBride waited, his hands stuffed into the pockets of a coat draped over a cheap suit. The driver pulled alongside the man. The vehicle stopped only long enough for him to grant entrance to the unwanted intrusion. "'Thanks for meeting me. I know this is a risk.' McBride spoke as he slid inside, his eyes cagily searching the interior. Oh, my, I wasn't expecting company. Charbonneau kept his eyes on McBride, who was quite charmed by his mantis. From experience, he knew that her expression would not change with the flattery. Her hand tightened on his thigh ever so slightly, communicating her dislike for the man. But McBride was obviously pleased at finding a beautiful woman so near. Charbonneau had seen the look before. Taken by her beauty, many men underestimated her, another one of his distinct advantages. "'You said it was urgent. I trust your judgment,' Charbonneau interrupted. Of course, nothing could be further from the truth. But stroking the man's ego felt prudent.' A long, tedious moment passed before McBride shifted his eyes away from Mantis. Eventually, the man's gaze dropped to the decanter of cognac, and with a nod he gestured his intention. May I? Motioning his permission, Charbonneau made a mental note to fumigate the interior of the vehicle and toss what was left of a very fine family blend of liquor. What is so very important, Mr. McBride? I had hoped to keep our meetings to a minimum, for both our sakes. Without an ounce of appreciation, the man tossed back the liquor as if it were cheap swill, wiping his mouth with the back of his hand. Yeah, I know, but something came up. Setting down his empty glass, McBride shifted his eyes to the woman, then back to him. Can I speak freely? Certainly, he replied, ignoring the usual social etiquette of an introduction to his female companion. Mantis slid closer to him, insinuating her intimacy without so much as a word. Before I get into it, I have to ask, did you deliberately arrange for Detective Raven Mackenzie to be the homicide cop on this case? The man smiled. Spikes of short blonde hair stood at attention atop his head. Icy gray eyes awaited his reply. A brooding Beethoven filled the void in conversation. Charbonneau's eyes drifted toward the television screen once more, finding it more suitable viewing than the crass man sitting before him. The cheetah inched its way through the brush, then leapt from cover to launch an attack, its lean, muscular body poised for the kill. A smirk fought for freedom. He indulged it. It was kismet. I couldn't pass up such an opportunity on your behalf, and fringe benefits are plentiful with a job well done. Do you approve of my idea of job satisfaction, Mr. McBride? I don't know how you arranged it, Blue Blood. I am truly in awe of your influence and abilities. But surely you must know how much I hate cops, and that I have a long memory when it comes to settling an old score. McBride's eyes darted to the TV, clearly avoiding his. He knew McBride had no appreciation for the raw power portrayed on the small screen, so for a brief moment he allowed himself to indulge in his pleasure, but one thought nagged him. 
Perhaps McBride had become a liability. The music began a foreboding crescendo, rousing his blood. Yet, despite the tension in the moment, he remained calm, unreadable. His gaze settled on the man. I knew you would want to tempt fate with a little retribution, but this mustn't interfere with my plan. What you do with her after our business arrangement is concluded, that is certainly up to you. Do we have an understanding, Mister McBride? Silence. A long moment passed between them. Logan finally replied, "I have no doubt we understand each other." On the surface, the man's remark might appear conciliatory, but Charbonneau suspected otherwise. McBride had indeed become a liability. For now, you have the ability to shape our future association, Mister McBride, and I, for one, eagerly await your course of action. Whether you work with me or choose another direction, I assure you, I am up for the challenge. Without saying a word, Mantis tensed, her muscles preparing to attack if necessary. He felt her body stiffen, anticipating trouble. I'll consider your advice. Logan glanced out the window, then returned his stare. Let me out here. I believe we've conveyed our intentions. I believe we have. He agreed, his expression rigid with contempt. Signaling his driver to pull over, he watched in silence as McBride left the limo. But the man turned back for a final point. Sometimes an animal must remain true to his nature. Don't you agree? You will get no argument here, sir. A lazy smile crooked his lips. I'm sure this goes without saying. But if you divulge our business arrangement to the authorities in any fashion. Being torn apart and devoured by savage beasts will seem like the mythological Elysian fields, and as you've seen, my influence transcends many boundaries. Consider your future carefully, Mister McBride. As the door slammed shut, he watched the smug expression of the man standing at the curb, waving farewell as the limo pulled away. McBride would be too impetuous to heed his warning. It would be quite gratifying to kill that man in a most painful manner. Yes, it would, Nikki. With a demure smile, Mantis slid her slender arm through his. Would you like me to take care of that? Eventually, my dear. But for now, Mister McBride will determine his own fate. If he can postpone his revenge, then he might prove a useful ally, and live a while longer. And if he cannot, then you and I may contrive a DVD of our own, featuring the vulgar Logan McBride. Her soft, feminine laughter made him smile as his cell phone rang. Yes, his greeting was cryptic. Very few people had his personal cell phone number. The familiar voice on the other end needed no introduction. The package that you wanted traced, we've located it. When can I meet you to discuss the particulars? Good work. Meet me in an hour at the usual location. Without a word more, he ended the call and turned to his lovely companion. Mantis, my dear, I'm afraid I must indulge in another diversion before we have dinner. I hope you don't mind. Her only response was to softly touch his cheek with a velvet stroke of a finger. Shifting his gaze toward the window, he inhaled deeply, then slowly released it in anticipation of his next meeting. He'd paid a lot of money to locate Fiona Dunhill. In his heart of hearts, could he destroy her, or would he ultimately settle for something short of complete annihilation? Regardless, he steeled himself for the next step of his plan. Only a face-to-face -face would determine her fate.
Chapter 7 the afternoon sun burned off the gray morning clouds, and glistening streams of melted snow held the promise of a break in the weather. None of it lightened Christian's mood as he drove his SUV down a deserted side street. His gut twisted over what he might find inside the old abandoned armory. Would he be opening a Pandora's box of Fiona's creation? After pulling a paper from his coat pocket, he confirmed the address. A gray cyclone fence, laden with rusted metal signs, declared the red brick armory to be the property of Dunhill Corporation. Set amidst other forsaken hulls of warehouses, the place looked like a disaster. In the fading gray of winter, even under the warming sun, it looked bleak and ominous. "'Why here, Mickey?' he muttered as he brought his vehicle to a stop. "'This place is not exactly your style.' Christian parked next to the main gate, then walked toward the entrance. He reached for the padlock and metal links dangling from the fence. No need for the set of keys in his slacks pocket. The chain had been severed, leaving the gate open. And just ahead, a discarded shell of a black Mercedes lay atop cinder blocks, stripped of anything valuable. Neon spray paint marred its once sleek finish. The local criminal element had marked their turf with cryptic taunts, thumbing their nose at law enforcement with bright paint. No attempt made to hide the metal remains. Through the vehicle identification number, the police would have identified it sooner or later. He had no need to check DMV records to know. It had once belonged to Mickey. Hunching his shoulders against the cold, he shoved his hands deeper into his coat pockets. You sure loved that car, Mick. Shadowed by the old building, a metal door lay to the right of the elevated delivery bays. The door looked like it would have been Mickey's only option. With a tug, Christian found the entry locked. He tried his keys and gained access. The sun poured in from the doorway, only dimly lighting the skeletal core of the old munitions factory. The gloom repelled the light as if the shapeless void were a sentient being, cowering from view and hoarding its secrets. Looking overhead, he noticed every window had been blackened, embellishing the sinister nature of the chamber. A faint smell of paint lingered in the air, making him believe the modification had been recent and very deliberate. He stepped farther into the darkness, but stopped short. Tiny feet skittered across the floor. With a frenzied screech, a rat darted to his right, shocked by the sudden exposure to daylight. The commotion caused a ripple effect. An army of unseen creatures slithered for more suitable places to hide, puckering the skin at the nape of his neck. God, I hate rats. The old building gave him a bad case of the creeps. The darkness came alive, seizing Christian with panic before he had mentally prepared for it. Despite years of therapy, he succumbed to the sensation, an unavoidable reaction. He kept the door open to reinforce his control over his phobia. If he shut it now, he'd be drawn into it, without footing. As if he were lying in a sensory deprivation tank, or had been set adrift in dead space, he sensed his equilibrium faltering. The oppressive silence weighed heavy, tightening his chest. He felt his breathing grow shallow. An old, familiar affliction. One thing was certain. The place could harbor his worst nightmare. No one needed to tell him Mickey had died here. Death loomed heavy in the putrid air. How he knew this, he couldn't quite grasp. Christian no longer questioned his bizarre link to the grim reaper. He just knew. In an instant, he'd been transported back to his childhood terror, the wound made fresh with his early morning nightmare. Deep breath. He found his center and searched for composure. The old terror was hard to quell. Now let it go. Slow. He uttered his reflexive mantra. To avoid being swallowed by his habitual fear, he shut his eyes. 
He listened patiently for his heart to slow until he no longer felt every single beat thrashing in his chest. Yet an odd sensation inched its way hot from his belly to his fingertips. An inexplicable aura warmed him, giving him immeasurable comfort. At first he couldn't place the peculiar tingle. Soon it had a name. Raven Mackenzie. The delicate scent of her skin bathed in fragrant soap. The tentative touch of her fingers along his stomach. The luster of her dark hair. Eyes that sucked you in, cradling you in safety. Unlike his usual recovery method for anxiety, the thought of Raven spread rapidly throughout his body and mind. It filled him with serenity. Unnerving. A part of him would have preferred a merciful rap upside the head with a baseball bat. Another side of him longed for— Damn it, he cursed. Quit thinking from below your belt. Finally losing the harsh rhythm to his heart, he opened his eyes again, letting Raven dissipate from his thoughts. Getting accustomed to the dark, he found the shapes making sense. Walls of wooden crates, rusted metal foundry equipment, and garbage lay piled in disarray, like his war room at the Dunhill estate. At least, that's what he told himself. Venturing into the shadows to his right, he felt for the lights. His fingers found a panel pulled from the wall, wires exposed. If the damage had been done years ago, he would have expected the wires to be encrusted with dirt or cobwebs. These were free of such texture. Whoever cut the wires hadn't intended Mickey to find the light switch operable near the main entrance. Closing his eyes again, he let his instincts take over, skills honed over the many years since the violent loss of his childhood. Just like the war room, Delacourt. He felt certain the old building maintained a minimal amount of electricity for security reasons. Allowing his mind to wander, he imagined how the electrical circuits might have been set up and began his systematic search for a backup light switch. If Mickey had died here, surely there must be clues to help him seek the truth, and he'd need light to do a thorough search. Making his way farther into the darkness, he kept his eyes shut, heightening his other senses. When he neared a solid obstruction, the airflow around him changed with only a faint subtlety. The perception brushed his skin. Coupled with that, sound bounced from the mass and deadened as he drew closer, giving it dimension. He supposed his ability was similar to that possessed by a bat with its sonar. With skill and agility, he sidestepped the obstacles in his path, eventually discovering another light panel in a far corner. This one had juice. The lights crackled to life, flickering a meager battle against the darkness until they eventually won out. He squinted and raised his hand to shield his sensitive eyes from the welcome intrusion. "'Why the hell did you come here, Mick?' he asked again. The place looked like a war zone. From where he stood, light shed no greater understanding." The obstacles he'd sensed earlier were arranged in a makeshift maze. Discarded machinery, heaps of trash, and rusted barrels were strewn in grand design. Barriers erected in a pattern created a funnel wider by the doorway, then narrowed as the path led farther away to an inner circle. He wandered the main passage, feeling certain Mickey would have done the same, but he had the benefit of electricity. Mick would have been lost in the dark. Small breaks in the barricades allowed access between the passageways, but unless the man had known the layout, his escape route would have led into countless dead ends like a frustrating maze. Catwalks and metal stairways overhead gave high ground to his attackers, making Mickey an easy target. When he neared the inner circle of the labyrinth, his jaw fell slack with shock. A sense of what the man had endured submersed him in an emotional quagmire. He pictured Mickey being tormented, pummeled from above, then ritualistically murdered in the center ring like the main event to a circus. The twisted mind that orchestrated the macabre killing staggered him, 
a prime example of the cruelty mankind visited on its own. The same kind of deranged mind that could pull the trigger on his younger sister while she ran to her mother in fear. Fueling his imagination, his senses dimmed the overhead lighting to black, setting the stage for savagery. Flashes of Mickey's terror darkened his eyes, infused by images of his own childhood trauma. Undistinguishable, visions lambasted him in rapid succession, embroiling him in a waking nightmare, blinding him. Now I lay me down to sleep. Please, God, help me! The tortured screams of a child filled his brain, powerless, trapped, happening all over again. But a familiar voice beckoned him to release his pain. The voice cried out, Stop where you are, Delacourt. We've got a warrant to search the place. As if he had emerged from a thick haze, his mind slowly cleared. A figure eclipsed a bright light like a vaporous mirage. He raised his hand to shield his eyes. An image of a woman came into focus. Detective Mackenzie hurried toward him, armed with a document. Her partner was close behind. No doubt he'd just lost his edge in the investigation. This is Dunhill property. What brings you here, detectives? His words sounded hollow. Jutting from his memory, cruel images still tortured him. No amount of posturing or stalling would help. What lay in the inner circle would be incriminating enough. He had no hope of dissuading her from her duty. Whatever evidence remained of Mickey's murder would clearly imply a connection to Fiona. No way to stop it. Given his link to the family, he'd consider it a stroke of good fortune if the police allowed him to stay involved with the case at all. Now he needed Raven on his side. How he would accomplish this feat? He had no idea. Slapping the paper to his chest, the detective smirked. Let's drop the charade, shall we? You ditched me earlier so you could come here alone and get a jump on your own investigation. Why are you here, Christian? Raven questioned. But the sound of her voice carried in the chamber. They'd have no privacy to talk about how he'd acquired the address. He didn't know how to answer without giving himself away. So he didn't. Saving him from the wrath of Detective Mackenzie, her partner stepped past him, making his way to the inner circle. "'You touch anything, Mr. Delacourt?' the man asked. "'No, just got here. It took me a while to find lights that worked.' His eyes shifted to the floor, taking in the disturbing scene. "'What the hell?' The cement floor was stained a deep brown, the stench of blood still in the air. Arterial spray tainted a wall like a gruesome display of modern art. Dried blood told the story. Mickey had died here, in this desolate place. The man's coat and tie were carefully laid out on the floor, away from the heaviest concentration of blood. Shirt buttons had been gathered and set beside the high-priced coat in mockery, trivializing Mick's lifestyle at the scene of his slaughter. Whoever killed him had no respect for the law. Everything had been laid out for the police in obvious contempt. Most shocking were the copies of newspaper clippings placed upon a grouping of wooden crates. Some were unrecognizable, but the ones he knew well stole his breath like a punch to the gut. Family massacred. Gunmen kill family. Police action investigated. The headlines and photos of his childhood terror filled his eyes and blurred them with tears. Disturbing as these articles were, those set alongside them made his mind reel with even more questions. A chill shivered through him and exposed his heart with the precision of a surgeon. Charles Dunhill murdered. Sniper kills prominent local. What? connection did the murder of Charles Dunhill have to his family's horror? Whoever killed Mickey Blair knew the answers. Suddenly, the sign pinned to Mick's chest invaded his confusion. Seek the truth, Christian. The truth about what? 
His eyes zeroed in on the newspaper clippings, blocking out the rest of the world, a world that had ceased to exist for him in that instant. He felt entrenched in his past. Sinking to one knee, he picked up one of the articles with trembling fingers. A tear lost its hold and trailed down his cheek. Reality hit hard. His past had been nothing more than an illusion, devoid of substance. Fiona must have known, yet she had chosen to leave him floundering in ignorance. The only person he trusted had left him behind to discover the truth on his own. But why? Who the hell was he, and why was he connected to so much death? Christian slumped to the cement floor, stunned. Raven knew he shouldn't be touching the evidence, but she couldn't deny the man his shocking disbelief. He looked dazed. Her heart ached for him. Scott, we're gonna need a team here. Tony's voice droned in the background. Her partner served as a stark reminder of her duty. Despite her feelings to the contrary, she'd come to do a job, and Christian was not officially part of it. Kneeling by his side, she clasped his hand and squeezed it. She found defeat in his eyes. Christian, come with me. She felt sure he hadn't heard her at first. Then he stood and let her lead him through the maze toward the doorway. Although he stared straight ahead, he looked completely lost. Only a small part of him remained. With the sun low in the sky, a chill captured the intruding night air, hurling a gust at their feet. Standing by the entrance, she broke the silence. "I'll make sure you get copies of the articles," she offered. In reply, he merely lowered his head. What do you think they mean? Obviously, the killer staged it all. By the pained expression on his face, she knew the question already had occurred to him. He just shook his head. For a long while, she wasn't sure he'd speak. Seek the truth, Christian. I wish I knew. His thought trailed off, vanquished by his overwhelming ordeal. He didn't hide the emotion, nor had he wiped the drying path of a tear. Her attraction deepened, but she had a job to do. What do you know about the murder of Charles Dunhill? The accusation was absent from her voice. He'd been only a boy when Dunhill had been murdered. I want to help you find the truth, Christian. Please let me do that. I'm afraid of what I'm going to find, Raven. The honesty caught in his throat. I thought I knew who I was, but now, you told me that Mickey might have supplemented his income with a sniper rifle, and Charles Dunhill was killed by a sniper. Her words hung in the air like a malevolent cloud. Judging by his reaction, she knew it wasn't directed at her, yet his fierce green eyes absorbed her insinuation without a word, eventually softening to his shattered acceptance of her rationale. Do you think that's the connection to Mickey? Could he have killed Dunhill? Maybe that's the truth the killer wants you to find. I don't know. It was so long ago, but I think the killer assumes there's a link. Maybe the bigger question is why Dunhill was killed. That's the truth I need to find. That reason could shed some light on my past. He closed his eyes and lowered his chin. His shoulders slumped with the weight of his only reasonable course of action. Look, I know I have no right to ask this, but can you locate the old police files for the Dunhill murder investigation? Maybe we can find a lead there. We? She questioned. Now we're a team. I deserved that. By the look of him, Christian knew how tenuous his status was in their investigation. But it didn't stop him from trying. She understood completely. If their roles had been reversed, it wouldn't have stopped her either. I'm asking you, please. You said you wanted to help. I need you, Raven. I can't do this on my own. She searched his eyes. God, how she wanted to trust him. 
and as much as he needed help from the police, she and Tony could certainly benefit from his complete cooperation. Obviously, the case dealt with his past. Still, she had an active investigation to conduct in the here and now. As if she were walking a tight wire, she balanced between personal desire and duty. No safety net. Let me talk it over with Tony. But if we share the old case file, I have to know you're completely with us. No more hidden agendas. I understand. And for me, there's more at stake here than just my past. Not sure I can make any promises until I talk to someone. Can you accept that? Raven had been willing to give him the benefit of the doubt. She expected a show of relief on his face, but instead his usual somber expression returned. Tinged with a seductive vulnerability, all he had to do was play ball. But he warned her that he couldn't make promises. Someone was in harm's way, and he'd forgo his own motives to protect whoever it was. Things just got complicated. You're stretching my patience, Delacourt. She furrowed her brow, unsure how to proceed. Another tack occurred to her. Can you think of any place else that Mickey might have kept some kind of locker? I found a key in his desk that seemed out of place. He thought for a moment. Nothing comes to mind, but give me time to think on that. I need a show of good faith, Christian. You're not giving me anything to work with here. I know, he muttered, but I will. It's just that there's something I have to do first. An undercurrent of anxiety contradicted his usually stoic nature, completely understandable. But it also looked like he struggled to confide in her, throwing her off balance. How could she rely on him? With a new resolve, he affirmed her notion. I want you to trust me, but I haven't given you much reason to do that. Somewhere in his words, she searched for honesty, needed to find it. Christian gazed upon her as if seeing her for the first time. He brushed back a strand of her hair. The act of tenderness implied an affection he hadn't communicated before now. It seduced the very breath from her lips, and by the restrained desire in his eyes, the move even caught him by surprise. Have dinner with me tonight. He pulled from her and threw out his invitation as he stepped through the door, safely distancing himself. We need to talk. My house, eight sharp. I'll cook. Her mouth promised what she couldn't deliver. For her, cooking was anything stuck in the microwave, ready in five minutes, or a heaping bowl of cereal. After giving him her address, she added, "You bring the wine." Despite a lack of competence in the kitchen, she promised a home-cooked meal, like they'd done this a thousand times. A faint smile touched his lips, like he read her mind. It had been so subtle she might have missed it altogether. Thanks, he replied. Picking up his pace, he headed for his car just as her team of CSI pulled onto the street. What the hell had just happened? Tony stepped beside her. So you got a hot date tonight and dinner, no less. He crossed his arms over his chest. Is this a subtle interrogation technique, plying him with an overload of carbs and Pinot Noir? He wants to talk. My wife Yoli will be the first one to tell you, I am a guy, and even if she didn't want to personally vouch for me, I got my man card to prove it. So I've got a pretty good idea what's on his mind. Not sure about you. Like the book says, women are from Pluto. And men are fresh from Uranus. What's your point, Tony? He turned toward her with a hesitant smile and placed his hand on her elbow, giving it a tug. The guy's got more baggage than the airlines, Mac. And I should know. One of them still has my best Samsonite, a family heirloom lovingly bundled in duct tape. It might be you're setting up for a very big fall. Despite his attempt at humor, concern shaped his expression when he spoke again. And we haven't absolved him from any wrongdoing here. Keep that in mind. You're playing a very dangerous game with a guy who might have invented the word dangerous. When you look up the word in the dictionary, yeah, I know I'm gonna find his picture. 
she sighed, paraphrasing his long-standing joke. And he'll be smiling. Still, if he does want to talk, you might be able to learn something useful about his past. Hooking a knuckle under her chin, he badgered her culinary skills. Why don't you stick around here for a while, then take off when you need to? Knowing you, your cupboards are bare of anything remotely edible by a man's standards. You'll need time to grocery shop and memorize a cookbook or two. I can take care of things here. Oh God, you're right. Why did I promise to cook? A jumble of expletives rolled from her mouth, easing a chuckle from Tony. You're gonna do fine, he lied, not very adept at the art. Just take care of your heart, partner. His expression grew more solemn. That part could use some Kevlar. She smiled at Tony, giving his shoulder a soft punch. Thanks for the tip, tough guy. Your Yolanda is one lucky woman. That's what I keep trying to tell her. He laughed. Backing away, she let the CSI crew through the doorway, nodding a greeting. Come on, Tony. We got a crime scene to process. The quicker we start, the sooner you'll be home with your beautiful wife and adorable kids. If I get home at a reasonable hour, Yoli will think I'm a burglar. She'd shoot me if she allowed a weapon in the house besides my service revolver. Maybe you're the one needing the Kevlar, my friend. She loved getting the rare opportunity to make Tony laugh. Usually, it was the other way around. Given their work, it tipped the scales to have a partner she had grown to love like a brother. Within an hour, Raven rushed home via the neighborhood grocery store, a list of ingredients filling her brain. Before leaving, she heard Tony arrange to hitch a ride back to the station house with one of the crime scene techs. Beyond the normal anxiety surrounding her unsteadiness in the kitchen, her pulse raced at the thought of Christian in her home. She'd been trained to defend herself against larger opponents, scored well at the firing range, was proficient in multiple weapons. Yet the idea of this man crossing her threshold, being invited to share her personal space, unnerved her beyond reason. After all, she was no Martha Stewart. What the hell had she been thinking? I made you a promise, Logan. I know where the pretty detective lives. Vinny beamed as he spoke into his cell phone, pleased he'd finally satisfied McBride on the subject of Raven Mackenzie. And you were right; it looks like she lives alone. With the heater in his truck faltering, he recited the address, giving the man a general sense of the location. The small bungalow was situated northwest of Wrigley Field, in a quiet neighborhood of neatly trimmed lawns, flower boxes, pruned hedges, and unattached garages set behind cyclone fences. He imagined the quiet suburb would be thrown off its axis when Logan McBride arrived. You think she'd be receptive to a mail caller? McBride asked, on such short notice. Logan's soft laughter sent shivers down Vinny's spine. He'd been on the receiving end of the man's idea of humor. A small part of him felt sorry for the woman. Fortunately, this weakness was short-lived, as he suspected the detective might soon be. She's just been grocery shopping. I'm sure she's up for some entertaining. He replied. If Logan hadn't been in the picture, Vinny would have considered paying a social call himself. His blood churned south, giving rise to his show of bravado. Good job, Vin. Now get out of there before you draw flies. Logan ended the call with his usual lack of protocol. Shifted into gear, his old truck rumbled a protest when it lurched forward. Vinny grinned, content he'd done what he could to please McBride. He served up the good detective on a platter, ripe for the taking. After tonight, Detective Raven Mackenzie would understand what it felt like to have the devil cross her path. As for himself, he wasn't sure if he considered his involvement with Logan a curse or a questionable stroke of good fortune, but he was willing to share the experience. Dusk resisted the impending darkness with the last-ditch effort of the sun, spewing tendrils of pale orange across a surging night sky. 
the sheer draperies of his bedroom window flushed in pastel. Yet in the dying light, his sense of urgency mounted. Christian rationalized that the tension stemmed from his habitual reaction to the coming darkness, understanding and accepting the daily occurrence. But his stress was exacerbated by his concern for Fiona. He stopped his pacing and pulled back the fabric, hoping the view of the lingering sunlight would calm him. But two of his security personnel, dressed in black uniforms and carrying weapons, patrolled along a pathway outside his bedroom window. The reality of his predicament made painfully clear. Despite the beauty surrounding him, the threat of violence existed. It was his life. With a heavy sigh, he let the drape fall. Turning, he stared at the phone on his nightstand. Christian dreaded what he had to do. It went against years of trust, built by a bond forged from a fragile and broken childhood. But he couldn't put it off any longer. He had to find Fiona, retrace her movements. Slowly he moved toward his bed and sat on the edge of his mattress, imagining the sound of her voice. Still, he had no idea what she'd say. How was she connected to Mickey? To him, she'd admitted a link to the man— if the police discovered that Mickey had killed Charles Dunhill, would the next logical leap be that Fiona had been involved in her husband's death? And what did all this have to do with his family's massacre? Dread filled him, jarring bile in his stomach. Dialing the number to Dunhill Security, he waited for someone to answer. Security, Edward speaking. Hey, Bill, this is Christian. Any luck on that special assignment I gave you? Christian had known Bill Edwards for a number of years. Trusting the man to be discreet, he had asked him to do a preliminary search on Fiona's whereabouts. The connection between Mickey and the Dunhill Armory had instigated his initial concern, and after seeing the place, he felt glad he'd assigned the job to this man. Not yet, Christian, but something of interest just came up. I was getting ready to call you. Oh, what's up? He wasn't sure he could handle another complication. Someone representing themselves as Dunhill Security has been asking about Mrs. Dunhill. Apparently, they're attempting to do the very thing you've asked from me, trying to find her. The grave tone of his voice only mirrored Christian's apprehension. Whoever it is has contacted the hangar and some of her favorite haunts in Europe. I've determined they came up empty so far, but maybe their luck will turn. What do you want me to do? He shut his eyes and took a deep breath. Someone else searched for Fiona. It took him a moment to compose himself enough to speak. Keep looking for her. When she wants to hide, she's a damned ghost. I just wish she wasn't so good at it. I'll keep in touch, Christian. You'll know something the second I do. Thanks. And, Bill, keep this assignment between you and me. I know, boss. Hang in there. Without fanfare, the call ended. But he was more worried now than before. Why had Fiona run, and who trailed her now? The part that hurt the worst was her lack of faith in him to help her. He owed her his life, and she hadn't trusted him with her own. Rising from the bed, he yanked the shirt tail from his slacks and unbuttoned his shirt, heading for the bathroom in a long shower. He wanted to talk to Fiona before committing to help the police, but now his surrogate mother would have to trust his judgment on the matter. The old police files on the assassination of Charles Dunhill might hold the key to this whole mystery, or be the last nail in Fiona's coffin. He had no choice. With someone after Fiona, his instincts told him to push ahead. And after the way he'd treated the beautiful Raven Mackenzie, he'd have to coerce her into helping him. The thought of pressing her for help didn't entirely displease him. Steam from the shower billowed in the small bathroom and blurred the mirror in a matter of minutes. Out of habit, Raven cracked the door an inch to let the moisture escape before she stepped in. Her old home had its bothersome idiosyncrasies, offset by the treasured memories crammed into every nook and cranny. Normally more frugal with her hot water, Raven made this concession to relax after a long day. 
slipping her fluffy white terry cloth robe from her shoulders, she hung it on a hook and slid open the opaque shower door. After stepping into the bathtub, she closed the door and breathed in thick steam. A low gasp escaped her lips when the water doused her skin, reddening the surface. As she stuck her head directly under the hot blast, the water tingled her scalp and massaged her body with its scorching pressure. She closed her eyes and let the steady steam pummel her. Hot water poured down her face and shoulders. God, it felt good. It almost made her forget she had a guest coming. Almost. Spaghetti sauce was set to a low simmer on her stove. Bubbling pockets of tomato sauce infused fresh herbs all through the ingredients. A simple salad cooled in her refrigerator. All that remained was to cook the pasta and to pop garlic bread under the broiler. Her father had taught her the sauce recipe handed down from a mother who died when she was too young to cherish any real remembrances. It had been her father's way of sharing the woman he loved. So with every ingredient, her mother's devotion now filled her family home with a heady aroma. Cooking for one had always been a challenge. It had been a long time since she'd invited someone for a home-cooked meal. Too long. Her small dining table was set for two, and thus far she had successfully resisted the urge to place candles as a centerpiece. This wasn't a date, she reminded herself. The last time she checked her manual on police procedures, candles were not a necessary formality for an interrogation. Under normal circumstances, a smile touched her lips. A man like Christian was anything but routine. Night had robbed the sky of light. Logan loved the anonymity of the dark. The modest neighborhood was now steeped in shadows. Only the occasional security light at a side door or the glow from a living room window would give him away if he were silhouetted by it. He parked on the next block over. Now on foot, he slowly crept closer to her bungalow, careful not to be noticed. He had the tools he needed to break in. Now all he needed was a dark corner to work. He sneered when he found it. A tall evergreen shrub would give him cover, protection from any unwanted attention from a nosy neighbor. Carefully, he unscrewed an overhead light bulb by the carport, his hand insulated by a black leather glove. Cops were just as vulnerable to home invasion; their egos probably made them feel invincible. After carefully peering through a small window in the door, he made sure he wouldn't be walking into a gun and began his work on the lock. The entry gave way without so much as a creak to announce him. Sliding into the kitchen of Raven Mackenzie, he smelled the aroma of her dinner. By the amount of food she expected company, the thought of getting caught only heightened his exhilaration. But if she walked in on him now, he'd have to kill her. That would spoil all his fun. After all, he had plans for her. With his gloved hand, he grabbed a wooden spoon and sampled her spaghetti sauce. It tasted homemade, not just a lame facsimile out of a bottle like his men ate. The flavor piqued his taste buds, and his interest in the woman. Good looks, and she cooked. What a waste, considering what he had in mind. The sound of the shower made his body react. He pictured the woman naked, her skin covered only sparingly by soap suds. The thought aroused him. With even greater audacity, he skulked down the hallway toward the sound. Blood coursed through his veins at breakneck speed. Passing through a hallway of framed mementos, Logan felt powerful and bold, even in sight of her family's smiling faces. His intrusion made a mockery of it all. Then his eyes were drawn to an old photo of a cop in uniform. "Fuck you, asshole," he whispered. "You're gonna regret messing up my life." Logan felt certain the man heard his curse even from the depths of hell. "You and every cop that dares to screw with me." Over his shoulder, he spied the bathroom door and opened it slightly. So damned easy. Lurking in the shadows beyond the light, he peered inside. With a gray eye pressed near the opening, he caught the cloudy reflection of her body. 
She moved seductively under the water. Dark strands of hair clung to her skin. Curves of flesh wafted in and out of focus with the billowing steam. The tantalizing image made him hard as a rock. Then a devilish thought took hold. He knew what he had to do. Reaching for the shampoo in her shower caddy, she poured the creamy lotion into her hand, then lathered her hair. Tiny bubbles popped in her ears and tickled her skin, muffling the sounds from her bathroom. Suds trailed down her face. She loved the scent and didn't bother to wipe away the lather. Besides, with eyes closed, she could better imagine Christian. The motion of her hands slowed to a crawl as she slathered frothy shampoo across her face and down her arms. The sensation magnified and focused her thoughts on the man. She relived the instant she'd frisked him. Once again, her fingertips felt the muscled texture of his belly, entwined in the soft curls of body hair. His warm skin smelled so good. With him leaning against the wall, she had caught only a brief glimpse of the small of his back. But that part of the male anatomy always enticed her hands, beckoning them to play. Her imagination embellished the taut sinews of his back and broad shoulders. She found her breathing escalating. The man was an inspiration. The mental picture spurred her blood until an obscure shadow dimmed the bathroom light. Even though soap suds covered her eyes, she still detected the movement. A dark shape eclipsed the light fixture. The sensation shocked her. This couldn't be happening. Not in her home. Every instinct in her body screamed a warning. Her heart seized in panic. Had she only imagined it? Then a rush of cold air brushed her skin. Imagination be damned! This was real. Naked, Raven had never felt so vulnerable 